Hi, listeners. I hope you're feeling well, and I hope your family is prospering in the new global economy, at least to the extent they deserve. For the next couple of hours, I will be your content provider. Regarding the title of this book, Napalm and Silly Putty, some time ago I was struck by the fact that among many other wondrous things, man has had the imagination to invent two such distinctly different products. One, a flaming jellied gasoline used to create fire, death, and destruction. The other, a clay-like mass good for throwing, bouncing, smashing, or pressing against a comic strip so you can look at a backwards picture of Popeye. I think the title serves as a fairly good metaphor for man's dual nature, while also providing an apt description of the kind of thoughts that occupy me, both in this book and in my daily life. On the one hand, I kind of like it when a lot of people die, and on the other, I always wonder how many unused frequent flyer miles they had. The only difference between lilies and turds is whatever difference humans have agreed upon, and I don't always agree. I had an interesting morning. I got into an argument with my Rice Krispies. I distinctly heard, snap, crackle, fuck you. I'm not sure which one of them said it. I was reaching for the artificial sweetener at the time and not looking directly into the bowl. But I heard it, and I said, well, you can all just sit right there in the milk as far as I'm concerned until I find out which one of you said that. Mass punishment. The idea is to turn them against one another. Hmm, silly me. Big punishment. That's what Rice Krispies do. Sit in the milk. That's their job. You've seen them. Delicate beige blisters of air floating proudly in the milk. And you can't sink them. They refuse to sink. The Navy ought to use Rice Krispies and life preservers. That's where they're really needed. And do you know how Rice Krispies manage to float for such a long time? By clinging to one another. They buddy up. They gather in little groups of eight, ten, or sometimes twelve, but if you've noticed, it's always an even number. That's because the electromagnetic polarity of the Krispies attracts them to one another. It binds them into pairs like subatomic particles. They form little colonies, and you can't sink them, not even with a spoon. They just come bobbing up over the sides of the spoon, laughing at you and reveling in their buoyancy. Hard to sink. That's what the fruit is for. Not for added taste, not for nutrition, it's for sinking the Rice Krispies. Believe me, a good-sized peach hurled at the bowl full force from a stepladder can take down 80 or 90 of the little buggers in one glorious splash. And I have absolutely no mercy. If I'm really pissed off, I'll climb up to the upstairs balcony and drop a watermelon on them. That'll teach them to sass me at breakfast. <laughs> Most people understand that cats are completely different from dogs, and generally they like them for different reasons. One quality people like in cats is their independence. They appreciate a pet who can take care of himself. I never have to do a thing. He cleans his room, makes his own clothing, and drives himself to work. Unlike dogs who are needy and dependent, and who like you merely because you know where the food is located, cats don't get all hung up on fake affection. They don't go nuts and slobber all over you when you come home the way a dog does. They parcel out a certain limited amount of physical affection from time to time, but it probably has more to do with static electricity than anything else. Cats have another quality I find admirable, blamelessness. When a cat makes a mistake, he doesn't accept responsibility or show embarrassment. If he does something really stupid, like jumping up onto a table and landing in four separate coffee cups, somehow he passes the whole thing off as routine. Dogs aren't like that. If a dog knocks over a lamp, you can tell who did it by looking at the dog. He acts guilty and ashamed. Not the cat. When a cat breaks something, he simply moves along to the next activity. What's that? The lamp? Not me. Fuck that. I'm a cat. Something broken? Ask the dog. A cat can make any mistake appear intentional. You ever seen a cat race across a room and crash into a glass door? Doesn't phase him at all. Whoosh! Bam! I meant that. I actually meant that. That's exactly what I was trying to do. Then he limps behind the couch holding his head. Oh, Jesus. Fucking meow. God damn fucking meow. Your cat is much too proud to let you see him suffer. But if you look behind the couch, you'll see him recuperating from a domestic mishap. I tried to jump from the sofa to the window. Didn't make it. Tore a ligament. Got milk? 
Cats are very tactile. They love to rub against your leg. If you own a cat and you have a leg, you got a happy cat. Oh boy, oh boy, I'm rubbing against his leg. How I love his leg. If you have two legs, you got yourself a party. Oh boy, oh boy, two legs. Now I can do the figure eight. They love to do the figure eight. Around one leg, in between, and then around the other. Oh boy, oh boy, I'm doing the figure eight. He'll rub against your legs even if you're not there yet. You might be 20 feet down the hall. As soon as he sees you coming, he starts walking sideways. He doesn't want to miss a shot at your legs. Oh boy, oh boy, here he comes. Soon I'll be doing the figure eight. Cats are so tactile, you don't even have to do the petting. All you need is to put your hand somewhere near him, and he'll lean into you and do all the work. They love to push back. Then there's the ass trick. Did you ever stroke a cat who's lying absolutely flat, and before you've run your hand halfway down his back, his ass is sticking way up in the air, as if you pressed an ass button or something? Isn't he a cute little... Holy shit, how did he do that? Or sometimes if he's on the bed with you, he'll climb onto your chest and stick his ass right in your face. Hey, here's my ass. Check my ass, Daddy. Get a nice clean look at my ass. And then while he's showing you his ass, he starts that kneading thing with his paws, like he's playing the piano. God, I hate that. Get him off of me. Jesus, I hate that. I don't even know what it is, and I hate that. It's as if he got a hold of some bad drugs or something. What is that? It's an instinctive nursing behavior, honey. He misses his mommy. Eh, you always say that. You said that about the mailman. The story is that if you're condemned to death, they have to give you one last meal of your choice. Now, what is that all about, anyway? I mean, a group of people plans to kill you, so they want you to eat something you like? Is it a joke? Do they think the food part will take your mind off the dying part? Or do they just prefer to kill you when you're coming off a peak experience and you're full of positive energy? I'm not sure what kind of sick game is going on, but what the hell, you might as well play along. Have a little fun. Order a Happy Meal. Tell them you want to go to Hooters and eat on the patio. Inform them you've converted to a religion that embraces cannibalism and you'd like to eat a baby with a small salad. I just think there's some great potential here for fun and mischief. In fact, I'm thinking that if you worked it just right, you might even squeeze a little extra time out of them. Time to file a couple of hundred more frivolous appeals. Because as I understand it, they have to give you any meal you ask for. Not including elephant, of course. You can't expect them to start in a whole new elephant just for one meal. But short of that, they have to give you pretty much what you want. It's part of the humanity involved. Let's kill this fuck, but let's be civil. So I say have a little fun. Buy some time. When they ask you what you want, tell them you can't decide. That's all there is to it. You can't decide. Gee, I don't know. I'm not sure if I want steak or lobster. I mean, I really love them both. Haven't had lobster in quite a while. But on the other hand, I really love chicken. It's my good luck food. And they're both rich in protein. I just can't figure it out. What can they do? Can they kill you under those circumstances? Can they go ahead and kill you if you honestly don't know what you want for dinner? Tell them you're willing to take a lie detector test and truth serum, but you honestly can't decide. Can they kill you? Huh? Can they drag you down the last mile screaming, Surf! Turf! I'm on the horns of a dilemma! I think they'd have to give you a little more time. Imagine if you kept it up for six months. Think of the headlines. Condemned man still alive, can't decide, leans toward lobster. Three years go by, five, seven, and then finally one morning you wake up and it's clear as a bell. All right, I've decided, and I don't know why I didn't think of this a long time ago. I'm going to have the lamb chops. All right, lamb chops it is. And how did you want them cooked? Jeez, I hadn't thought of that. Let me see. How do I want them cooked? Listen, guys, can I get back to you on that? Hungry man executed. Dragged down last mile, screaming, medium. <laughs> ah, to be a bird. To fly the skies, sing your song, and best of all, occasionally peck someone's eyes out. When he got loaded, the human cannonball knew there were not many men of his caliber. I don't like porno movies. They piss me off. 
First, they show a great-looking naked woman who starts playing with herself. And while I'm watching, she sort of becomes my girlfriend. And then suddenly, in walks a guy with a big dick, and he starts fucking my girlfriend. Pisses me off. Most people with low self-esteem have earned it. Haven't we gone far enough with this colored ribbons for different causes? Every cause has its own color. Red for AIDS, blue for child abuse, pink for breast cancer. I got a brown one. Know what it means? Eat shit, motherfucker. I enjoy young people because they're really fucked up and they don't know what they're doing. I like that. I support all fucked up people regardless of age. In that book, Tuesdays with Maury, Maury Schwartz had Lou Gehrig's disease, but what isn't generally known is that because of a mix-up at the hospital, Lou Gehrig had Hodgkin's disease, Hodgkin had Parkinson's disease, and Parkinson had Alzheimer's disease. Unfortunately, Alzheimer couldn't remember whose disease he had. He thinks it might have been Wally Pip. Whenever you see more than two men sitting in a parked car after dark, you can be sure drugs are involved. When I die, I don't want to be buried, but I don't want to be cremated either. I want to be blown up. Put me on a pile of explosives and blow me up. Or throw my body from a helicopter. That would be fun. One stipulation, wherever I land, you have to leave me there. Even if it's on the mayor's lawn. Just let me lie there. But keep the dogs away. Isn't it nice that once your parents are dead, they can't come back and start fucking with you again? The trouble with a sitcom is that every week it's the same group of irritating assholes. People who say they don't care what people think are usually desperate to have people think they don't care what people think. You know what would be great? To be in a coma. You know, you're still alive, but you have no responsibilities. He owes me $6,000. He's in a coma. Oh, uh, okay. Never mind. If I had my choice of how to die, I'd like to be sitting on the Crosstown bus and just suddenly burst into flames. Have you noticed that fluorescent lights seem afraid to come on? When you turn on a fluorescent light, it flickers and hesitates, and it's sort of unsure of itself. Then after several seconds, it seems to gain confidence and light up at full strength. What's that all about? Couldn't these lamps be given some sort of counseling? The Christians are coming to get you, and they are not pleasant people. I recently bought a book of free verse for $12. If the police never find it, is it still a clue? You know, an odd feeling, sitting on the toilet eating a chocolate candy bar. You can't argue with a good blowjob. I've thought it over. And I've decided pus is okay. Every 60 seconds, 30 acres of rainforest are destroyed in order to raise beef for fast food restaurants that sell it to people, giving them strokes and heart attacks, which raise the medical costs and insurance rates, providing insurance companies with more money to invest in large corporations that branch out further into the third world so they can destroy more rainforests. When I was a kid, if a guy got killed in a Western movie, I always wondered who got his horse. Advertising Lullaby. Quality, value, style, service, selection, convenience, economy, savings, performance, experience, hospitality, low rates, friendly service, name brands, easy terms, affordable prices, money back guarantee. Free installation, free admission, free appraisal, free alterations, free delivery, free estimates, free home trial, and free parking. No cash, no problem, no kidding, no fuss, no muss, no risk, no obligation, no red tape, no down payment, no entry fee, no hidden charges, no purchase necessary, no one will call on you, no payments or interest till September. Limited time only, though, so act now, order today, send no money, offer good while supplies last, two to a customer, each item sold separately, batteries not included, mileage may vary, all sales are final, allow six weeks for delivery, some items not available, some assembly required, some restrictions may apply. So come on in for a free demonstration and a free consultation with our friendly professional staff. Our experienced and knowledgeable sales representatives will help you make a selection that's just right for you and just right for your budget. And say, don't forget to pick up your free gift, a classic, deluxe, custom, designer, luxury, prestige, high-quality, premium, select, gourmet pocket pencil sharpener. 
Yours for the asking, no purchase necessary. It's our way of saying thank you. And if you act now, we'll include an extra added free complimentary bonus gift at no cost to you. A classic deluxe custom designer luxury prestige high quality premium select gourmet combination key ring, magnifying glass, and garden hose in a genuine imitation leather style carrying case with authentic vinyl trim. Yours for the asking, no purchase necessary. It's our way of saying thank you. Actually, it's our way of saying, bend over just a little bit farther so we can stick this big advertising dick up your ass a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper, you miserable, no-good, dumbass fucking consumer. Here's something we all have in common, flying on big airplanes and listening to the announcements and trying to pretend the language they're using is English. Doesn't always sound like it to me. It starts at the gate. We'd like to begin the boarding process. Extra word, process, not necessary. Boarding is sufficient. We'd like to begin the boarding. Simple tells the story. People add extra words when they want things to sound more important than they really are. Boarding process sounds important. It's not. It's just a group of people getting on an airplane. But to begin their boarding process, the airline announces they will pre-board certain passengers. And I wonder, how can that be? How can people board before they board? This I gotta see. But before anything interesting can happen, I'm told to get on the plane. Sir, you can get on the plane now. And I think for a moment, on the plane. No, my friends, not me. I'm not getting on the plane. I'm getting in the plane. Let evil Knievel get on the plane. I'll be sitting inside in one of those little chairs. It seems less windy in there. Then they mention that it's a non-stop flight. Well, I must say I don't care for that sort of thing. Call me old-fashioned, but I insist that my flight stop, preferably at an airport. Somehow those sudden cornfield stops interfere with the flow of my day. And just about at this point, they tell me the flight has been delayed because of a change of equipment. And deep down, I'm thinking, broken plane. And speaking of potential mishaps, here's a phrase that apparently the airlines simply made up. Near miss. They say that if two planes almost collide, it's a near miss. Bullshit, my friend. It's a near hit. A collision is a near miss. <laughs> Look. They nearly missed. Yes, but not quite. Back to the flight. As part of all the continuing folderol, I'm asked to put my seat back forward. Well, unfortunately for the others in the cabin, I don't bend that way. If I could put my seat back forward, I'd be in porno movies. There's also a mention of carry-on luggage. First time I heard this term, I thought they said carry-on, and they were going to bring a dead deer on board. And I wondered, well, what the hell would they want with that? Don't they have those little TV dinners anymore? And then I thought, carry-on, carry-on, of course, people are going to be carrying on. It's a party. Well, I don't much care for that. Personally, I prefer a serious attitude on the plane, especially on the flight deck, which is the latest euphemism for cockpit. Can't imagine why they'd want to avoid a colorful word like cockpit, can you? Especially with all those lovely stewardesses going in and out of it all the time. By the way, there's a word that's changed. Stewardess. First it was hostess, then stewardess. Now it's flight attendant. You know what I call her? The lady on the plane. These days, sometimes it's a man on the plane. That's good. Equality. I'm all in favor of that. The flight attendants are also sometimes referred to as uniformed crew members. Oh, good, uniformed, as opposed to this guy next to me in the Grateful Dead t-shirt and the fuck you hat who's currently working on his ninth little bottle of Kahlua. As soon as they close the door to the aircraft, they begin the safety lecture. I love the safety lecture. It's my favorite part of the flight. I listen very carefully, especially to the part where they teach us how to use the seatbelt. Imagine that, a plane full of grown humans, many of them partially educated, and someone is actually taking the time to describe the intricate workings of a belt buckle. Place the small metal flap into the buckle. Well, at that point, I raise my hand and ask for clarification. Over here, please. Over here. Yes. Thank you very much. Did I hear you correctly? Did you say place the small metal flap into the buckle, or did you say place the buckle over and around the small metal flap? I'm a simple man. 
I do not possess an engineering degree, nor am I mechanically inclined. Sorry to have taken up so much of your time. Please continue with your wonderful safety lecture. Seatbelt. High-tech shit. The lecture continues. The next thing they advise me to do is to locate my nearest emergency exit. Well, I do this immediately. I locate my nearest emergency exit, and I plan my escape route. You have to plan your escape route. It's not always a straight line, is it? No. Sometimes there's a really big fat fuck sitting right in front of you. Well, I know I'll never be able to climb over him, so I look around for women and children, midgets and dwarfs, cripples, elderly widows, paralyzed veterans, and people with broken legs. Anyone who looks like they don't move too well. The emotionally disturbed come in very handy at a time like this. It's true I may have to go out of my way to find some of these people, but I'll get out of the plane a whole lot quicker, believe you me. My strategy is clear. I'll go around the fat fuck, step on the widow's head, push those children aside, knock down the paralyzed midget, and escape from the plane, in order, of course, to assist the other passengers who are still trapped inside the burning wreckage. After all, I can be of no help to anyone if I'm lying in the aisle unconscious with some big cocksucker standing on my neck. I must get out of the plane, make my way to a nearby farmhouse, have a Dr. Pepper, and call the police. The safety lecture continues. In the unlikely event, this is a very suspect phrase, especially coming as it does from an industry that is willing to lie about arrival and departure times. In the unlikely event of a sudden change in cabin pressure, roof flies off. An oxygen mask will drop down in front of you. Place the mask over your face and breathe normally. Well, no problem there. I always breathe normally when I'm in an uncontrolled 600 mile an hour vertical dive. I also shit normally, directly into my pants. Then they tell me to adjust my oxygen mask before helping my child with his. Well, that's one thing I didn't need to be told. In fact, I'm probably going to be too busy screaming to help my child at all. This will be a good time for him to learn self-reliance. If he can surf the fucking internet, he can goddamn jolly well learn to adjust an oxygen mask. It's a fairly simple thing, just a little elastic band in the back. Not nearly as complicated as, say, a seatbelt. The safety lecture continues. In the unlikely event of a water landing... A water landing? Am I mistaken, or does this sound somewhat similar to crashing into the ocean? Your seat cushion can be used as a flotation device. Well, imagine that. My seat cushion, just what I need, to float around the North Atlantic for several days, clinging to a pillow full of beer farts. The announcements suddenly cease. We're about to take off. Time for me to drift off to sleep, so the captain can later awaken me repeatedly with the many valuable sightseeing announcements he will be making along the way. I'm always amazed at the broad knowledge these men have of the United States and some of them apparently have really good eyesight. A few folks seated on the left side of the plane, that's old Ben Hubbard's place down there, and, and what do you know, there's Ben coming out onto his porch right now. What's he doing? By God, he's picking his nose. Wow, look at that one, that is one prize booger. And look, he's throwing it into a bush. Ain't that just like old Ben? Over on the right, <laughs> Suddenly, I'm awake. The flight is almost over, and somehow along the way, the captain has become politicized. His latest offering. Ladies and gentlemen, we have just begun our gradual descent into the Los Angeles area, similar in many ways to the gradual descent of this once great nation from a proud paragon of God-fearing virtue to a third-rate power awash in violence, sexual excess, and personal greed. I drift off again and awaken just as the end-of-flight announcements are being made. The captain has turned on the fastened seatbelt sign. Here we go again. Who gives a shit who turned on the sign? What does that have to do with anything? It's on, isn't it? And by the way, isn't it about time we found out who made this man a captain? Did I sleep through some sort of armed forces swearing-in ceremony? Captain my ass, the man is a fucking pilot, and he should be happy with that. If those sightseeing announcements are any mark of his intelligence, the man's lucky to be working at all. Having endured enough nonsense from this so-called captain, I finally raise my voice. Tell the captain Air Marshal Carlin says he should go fuck himself. The next sentence I hear is filled with language that pisses me off. 
Before leaving the aircraft, please check around your immediate seating area for any personal belongings you might have brought on board. Well, let's start with immediate seating area. Seat. It's a goddamn seat for any personal belongings. Well, what other kinds of belongings do they think I have? Public belongings? Do they honestly think I brought along a fountain I stole from the park? You might have brought on board. Well, I might have brought my Shoshone Arrowhead collection. I didn't, so I'm not going to look for it. Then they say we'll be landing shortly. Doesn't that sound like we're going to miss the runway? Final approach is not too promising either. Final is not a good word to be using on an airplane. Sometimes the pilot will speak up and say, We'll be on the ground in 15 minutes. Well, that seems a little vague. On the ground could mean any number of things. Most of them, not very good. By this time, we're taxiing in and the flight attendant is saying, Welcome to Los Angeles International Airport. Well, how can someone who is just arriving herself possibly welcome me to a place she hasn't gotten to yet? Doesn't this violate some law of physics? We've been on the ground barely four seconds and she's coming on like the mayor's wife. We're the local time. Well, of course it's the local time. What did they think I was expecting? The time in Norway? Enjoy your stay in Los Angeles or wherever your final destination might be. Someone should really tell these airline people that all destinations are final. That's what destination means. Destiny. It's final. Think of it this way. If you haven't gotten where you're going, you probably aren't there yet. The captain has asked... More shit from the bogus captain. You know, for someone who's supposed to be flying an airplane, he's taking a mighty big interest in what I'm doing back here. That you remain seated until he has brought the aircraft to a complete stop. A complete stop. Not a partial stop. No, because during a partial stop, I partially get up, partially get my bags, and partially leave the plane. Please continue to observe the no smoking sign until well inside the terminal. Folks, I've tried this. Let me tell you, it is physically impossible to observe the no smoking sign even from just outside the airplane, much less from well inside the terminal. In fact, you can't even see the airplanes from well inside the terminal. Which brings us to terminal, another unfortunate word to be using in association with air travel, and they use it all over the airport. Somehow, I can't get hungry at a place called the Terminal Restaurant. Then again, if you've ever eaten there, you know the name is quite appropriate. When you make a sandwich at home, do you reach down past the first few slices of bread to get the really good bread? It's sort of a survival thing. Let my family eat the rotten bread. I'll take care of numero uno. And sometimes the issue isn't the freshness, but it's the size of the slice you're after. Everyone knows the wider slices are somewhere down near the middle. So down you go, past about six inferior slices to reach the ones you want. And then as you pull them up, you have to be careful they don't tear. And then just before you get them out, the top six slices shift position and fall perpendicular to the rest of the loaf. I leave them that way. Let the family think a burglar made a sandwich. Cars and driving. You want to go for a ride? Okay, let's go for a ride. Actually, you'll go for a ride. I'll go for a drive. The one who drives the car goes for a drive. The other person goes for a ride. Most folks aren't aware of that. Tell them when they're getting into your car. Say, you assholes are going for a ride. I'm going for a drive. Because I'm the one who's making the payments on this shit box. Now, for purposes of description, you'll have to picture my car, an old, poorly maintained, dangerous collection of faulty parts from that wonderful time before safety became such a big goddamn deal in this country. My car's like any other small car, real hard to get into. That's important, because after all, you gotta get into the car first. Otherwise, the way I look at it, you ain't going nowhere. And let's not forget, with any kind of car, just opening the driver's door and getting in involves a certain amount of risk. Have you noticed that? The terrific way they design cars so the driver's door opens right out into the middle of goddamn traffic. Jesus, about the only intelligent thing the British ever did was putting that driver's seat right over there near the curb where it belongs. Of course, then they went and moved the curb to the wrong side of the street. Anyway, 
Like I said, no small car is easy to get into, but especially if you park the way I do. Illegally, two feet out from the curb on a busy high-speed thoroughfare right in the middle of rush hour. And that sort of car entry is even riskier if you got a two-door and you're trying to stuff a couple of shopping bags full of groceries into the back seat while everyone else is zipping past you close enough to smell your breath. Holy shit, look out, here comes a drunken bus driver. Quick, abandon groceries, stand up straight, squeeze against the car and pull that door as close to your body as you can, taking care, of course, not to cut off circulation to your feet. Holy shit, that was close. Good thing you went into emergency mode. And be honest, you didn't really need them groceries, did you? God damn, look at how flat that bus made everything. Imagine a flank steak with tread marks. And might that just possibly be potato juice on the ground? One more thing about car entry. My car has got one of them tricky kind of door handles, the kind that are recessed a little bit into the door itself. You know the ones I mean, where your fingers actually go in a little bit past the surface of the car till you grab a hold of the handle. Don't you like them? I do. That's why they don't make them anymore. They found out I like them. That's the way it is with everything. They find out I like it, they stop making it. Anyway, back to my car. I also got me one of them doors that when you open it, it swings all the way open. You know the kind I mean? All the way open, perpendicular to the car. I ain't got one of them fancy doors that hangs out there halfway and stays where you want it to. With my door, we got two things, open and shut. Pick one. And if I should be trying to do something really tricky, like get into the car, well, in a case like that, I gotta prop that door open with a broom handle. Because otherwise, sure as hell, soon as I'm halfway in, that door's gonna swing back hard as it can and sever my leg just below the knee. God, that shit hurts. Hurts for about a year and a half, don't it? And them huge purple blotches seems like they never go away. Now, I want to mention one additional problem I have when I'm getting into my car. Like I told you, it's kind of old and upkeep has been minimal, so there's another thing I got to deal with. A long time ago, my driver's seat got pushed way up forward on the runners, about as far as it can go, and apparently it ain't never coming back. You see, what happened was, years ago, about 30 or 40 of them little pop-top beer can rings got wedged into the seat tracks, and now they're all fused into one solid piece of metal, and that fucking seat ain't never gonna move again. Unless, of course, there's an atomic attack, in which case it probably ain't gonna budge more than an inch or two. So, because of all this unintentional seat redesign, when I get into full driving mode, I'm pretty much hanging out right behind the radiator. In fact, if I want to check my speedo, I gotta look straight down into my crotch. But hey, at least I'm in the car. But maybe you're not. Maybe I ought to mention one more common car re-entry problem. I know that some of you faint-hearted folks like to play it safe by parking right in the mall parking lot. And of course, when you park the car, you do so in such a manner that leaves you full access to the door. But while you're in the mall charging all that worthless merchandise, some asshole parks right next to you, leaves about six inches between cars, and now you can't get your door open more than three or four degrees at best. So, in order to gain access, you gotta try to wedge yourself through a tiny little crack while balancing six gift wrap packages all the time maintaining the integrity of a lit cigarette hanging off your lip. Besides which, your own particular lumbar spine is not the best one God ever put together, and everybody knows that even a proper back is not made for getting into a car under circumstances such as these. And by the way, as most men know, trying to squeeze into a car in that manner also creates a potential for serious ball injury from the steering wheel. Many's the family planning program that's gone out the window due to poor parking. Solution? Always park way down at the far end of the parking lot where the homeless people live. Your back and your balls will thank you, and the walk will do you good. Anyway, at this point I think we're all in the car, so now I'll just reach over here, and I'll just reach over here, and oh shit, goddamn door is still wide open. Well, maybe if I lean way out and stretch my arm as far as it'll go, maybe without actually getting up, I can actually reach out and... Ah, fuck it. It appears, folks, that today we're going to be driving with the door wide open. What the heck, it's a lovely day, and they say an open driver's door actually helps a little bit on left-hand turns. Acts like a rudder, increasing the drag factor on the port side. Okay. Now we're going to be taking our little drive in just a minute or two here, but first a philosophical question. 
Have you ever noticed that when you're driving, anyone going slower than you is an idiot, and anyone going faster than you is a maniac? Will you look at this idiot? Look at him, just creeping along. Whoa, holy shit, look at that maniac go. Well, I tell you folks, it's a wonder we ever get anywhere at all with all the idiots and maniacs out there, because no one ever drives at my speed. Actually, I don't let people drive at my speed. If I see some guy in the next lane keeping pace with me, I slow down. I let that asshole get a little bit ahead so I can keep an eye on him. I like to know who I'm driving near. In fact, quite often at a red light, I'll ask for personal references. You can never be too careful. Okay, now a few basic points about driving. One of the first things they teach you in driver's ed is where to put your hands on the steering wheel. They tell you to put them at 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock. Never mind that shit. I put mine at 9.45 and 2.17. Gives me an extra half hour to get where I'm going. Now, most drivers know that some things that happen in the car can cause great embarrassment. I've never done any of these things myself, of course, but I'm sure you'll recognize a few of them. Here's a good example. You ever been driving someone else's car, and for some reason they're in the car too? You know what I mean? Let's say they got pushed off the balcony of a crack house and broke both their ankles, and they can't drive, so you're taking them out to buy some crack. You're driving their car, but you're used to driving your car, and their gear shift handle is mounted on the opposite side from where yours is, and suddenly you go to shift gears and break their fucking turn signal off. Just break it clean off the steering column. Holy shit came right off, didn't it? God damn, you'll have to get a new one of them. Here, throw this old sucker out the window. It ain't no good to you now. Shit, that broke easy, didn't it? Some things break easy. Just break right off. Like radio dials, the old kind, the knob kind. Damn, those things were fragile. You'd be driving along just trying to tune in something on the radio, trying to find some kind of music you could actually tolerate, and you just keep turning and turning and turning that dial until finally you got way over onto the right-hand side of the dashboard and ran clean out of radio stations, and then, holy shit, came right off, didn't it? God damn, gotta throw that mother away. Give me a fresh one out of that little bag, will you? I got about 50 of those motherfuckers. Damn, they break easy. So you stick a new knob onto the radio and keep turning and turning and turning until finally you wind up past the glove compartment listening to some radio station located over near the right-hand mirror. Damn, some things break easy. I'm a great believer in using every piece of equipment on the car, every feature, every option, even if you don't need it. Fuck it, you paid for the car, use everything. Use the sun visor, even on a cloudy day. Flip it up, flip it down. Flip it over to the side like the French people do. Lower the passenger's visor, even if no one is sitting there. Open the ashtray, push in the lighter. Who cares if you don't smoke? Turn all the knobs, press all the buttons. Have a lot of fun. Change the mirrors all around. Press the trunk release, pop the hood open. Put your seat in a ridiculous position. Lower all the windows. Stick out your hand. Tell the other drivers to slow down. You have power. Use hand signals. Tell them to slow down, slow down, and then tell them to stop, stop, stop. Then let one guy go. Only one. Okay, you can go. Go, go, go. No, not you. Just him. Okay, now you. Go, go, go. You have power. Use it. Fuck it. You're making the car payments. Have a little fun. Ladies and gentlemen, we're privileged to have with us a man known around the world as the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. How are you, Jesus? Fine, thanks. And let me say, it's great to be back. Why, after all this time, have you come back? Mostly nostalgia. Could you tell us a little about the first time you were here? Well, there's not much to tell. I think everybody knows the story by now. I was born on Christmas, and actually that always bothered me, because I only got one present. You know, if I was born a couple of months earlier, I would have got two presents. But look, I'm not complaining. After all, it's only material goods. There's a story that there were three wise men. Well, there were three kings who showed up. I don't know how wise they were. They didn't look very wise. They said they followed a star. That don't sound wise to me. Didn't they bring gifts? Yeah, that's right. Gold, frankincense, and I believe myrrh, which I never did find out what that was. You don't happen to know what myrrh is, do you? Well, I believe it's a reddish-brown bitter gum resin. Ah, oh, great. Just what I need. What am I going to do with a gum resin? I'd rather have the money. That way I could buy something I need. You know, something I wouldn't normally buy for myself. Well, what would that be? Oh, I don't know. A bathing suit? I never had a bathing suit. Maybe a Devo hat? 
possibly a bicycle. I really could have used a bicycle. Do you realize all the walking I did? I must have crossed Canaan six or eight times, up and down, north and south, walking and talking, doing miracles, telling stories. Tell us about the miracles, Jesus. How many miracles did you perform? Well, leaving out the loaves and the fishes, I would say a total of 107 miracles. Well, why not the loaves and fishes? Well, technically, that one wasn't a miracle. It wasn't? No. Turns out a lot of people were putting them back. They were several days old. And besides, not all those miracles were pure miracles anyway. Well, what do you mean? If, if they weren't miracles, what were they? Well, some of them were parlor tricks, optical illusions, mass hypnosis. Sometimes people were just hallucinating. I even used acupressure. That's how I cured most of the blind people, acupressure. So not all of the New Testament is true? Nah, some of the gospel stuff never happened at all. It was just made up. Luke and Mark used a lot of drugs. Luke was a physician and he had access to drugs. Matthew and John were okay, but Luke and Mark would write anything. Well, what about raising Lazarus from the dead? First of all, he wasn't dead, okay? He was hungover. I've told people that. But in the Bible, you said he was dead. No, nah, I said he looked dead. I says, geez, Peter, this guy looks dead. You see, Lazarus was a very heavy sleeper. Plus, the day before, we had been to a wedding feast, and he had put away a lot of wine. Oh, was that the wedding feast at Cana, where you changed the water into wine? I don't know. We went to an awful lot of wedding feasts in those days. But did you ever really turn water into wine? Not that I know of. One time I turned apple juice into milk, but I don't recall the water and wine. All right, speaking of water, let me ask you about another miracle. What about walking on water? Did that really happen? Oh, yeah, that was one that really happened. You see, the problem was I could do it and the other guys couldn't. They were jealous. Peter got so mad at me, he had these special shoes made, special big shoes that if you started out walking real fast, you could stay on top of the water for a while. Then, of course, after a few yards, bada boom, down he goes right into the water. He sinks like a rock. That's why I called him Peter. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I shall build my church. Well, that brings up the apostles. Uh, what can you tell us about the apostles? They smelled like bait, but they were a good bunch of guys. Thirteen of them we had. Thirteen? The, the Bible says there were only twelve. Well, that was according to Luke. I told you about Luke. Actually, we had thirteen. We had, let's see, we had Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, that's a different James, Thaddeus, how many, how many is that now? That's, that's ten. Okay, uh, Simon, Judas, and Red. Red? Yeah, Red the Apostle. Red the Apostle doesn't appear in the Bible. Nah, Red kept pretty much to himself. He never came to any of the wedding feasts. He was a little strange. He thought the Red Sea was named after him. And what about Judas? Don't get me started on Judas, a completely unpleasant person, okay? Well, what about the other apostles? Say, for instance, Thomas. Was he really a doubter? Believe me, this guy Thomas, you couldn't tell him nothing. He's always asking me for ID. Soon as I would see him, he would go, you got any ID? To this day, he doesn't believe I'm God. And are you God? Well, partly. I'm a member of the Trinity. Yes. In fact, you're writing a book about the Trinity. That's right. It's called Three's a Crowd. As I understand it, it's nothing more than a thinly veiled attack on the Holy Ghost. Listen, it's not an attack, okay? It happens I don't get along with the Holy Ghost, so I leave him alone. That's it. What he does is his business. Well, what's the reason? Well, first of all, he's a wise guy. Every time he shows up, he's something different. One day he's a dove, another day he's a tongue of fire, always fooling around. I don't bother with the guy. I don't want to know about him. I don't want to see him. I don't want to talk to him. Well, then let me change the subject. Is there really a place called hell? Oh, yeah, there's a hell, all right. There's also a heck. It's not as severe as hell, but we've got a heck and a hell. What about purgatory? No, I don't know about no purgatory. We got heaven, hell, heck, and limbo. Well, what is limbo like? I don't know. No one's allowed in there. If anybody was in there, it wouldn't be limbo. It would just be another place. 
Oh, I see. Well, getting back to your previous visit, what can you tell us about the Last Supper? Well, first of all, if I'd have known I was going to be crucified, I would have had a bigger meal. You never want to be crucified on an empty stomach. As it was, I had a little salad and some veal. The crucifixion must have been terrible. Ah, yeah, it was awful. Unless you went through it yourself, you could never really know how painful it was. And tiring. It was very, very tiring. But I think more than anything else, it was embarrassing. You know, in front of all those people to be crucified like that. But I guess it redeemed a lot of people. I hope so. It would be a shame to do it for no reason. Were you scared? Ah, oh, yeah. I was afraid it was going to rain. I thought for sure I would get hit by lightning. One good thing, though, while I was up there, I had a really great view. I could actually see my house. There's always a bright side. And then three days later, you rose from the dead? Huh? On Easter Sunday, you rose from the dead, didn't you? Not that I know of. I think I would remember something like that. I do remember sleeping a long time after the crucifixion. Like I said, it was very tiring. I think what might have happened was I passed out and they thought I was dead. We didn't have such good medical people in those days. You know, it was mostly volunteers. And according to the Bible, 40 days later, you ascended into heaven. Pulleys. Ropes, pulleys, and a harness. I think it was Simon who came up with this great harness thing that went under my toga. You couldn't see it at all. Since that day, I've been in heaven, and all in all, I would have to say that while I was down here, I had a really good time, except for the suffering. And what do you think about Christianity today? Well, I'm a little embarrassed by it, you know. Jeez, I wish they would take my name off of it. If I had the whole thing to do over, I would probably start one of those Eastern religions like Buddha. Buddha was smart. That's how come he's laughing. So you wouldn't want to be a Christian? Nah, I wouldn't want to be a member of any group whose symbol is a man nailed onto some wood, especially if it's me. Buddha's laughing. Meanwhile, I'm on the cross. I have a few more questions. Do you mind? Hey, be my guest. How often do I get here? Are there really angels? Well, not as many as we used to have. Years ago, we had millions of them. Today, you can't get the young people to join. It got too dangerous with all the radar and the heat-seeking missiles. Well, what about guardian angels? Are there such things? Yes, we still have guardian angels, but now, with the population explosion, it's one angel for every six people. Years ago, everybody had his own angel. But changing the subject, do you really answer prayers? No. First of all, what with the sunspots and radio interference, a lot of prayers don't even get through. And between you and me, we just don't have the staff to handle the workload anymore. In the old days, we took pride in answering every single prayer. But like I said, there were less people then. And in those days, people prayed for something simple, to light a fire, to catch a yak, something like that. But today, you got people praying for hockey teams, for longer fingernails, to lose weight. We just can't keep up. Well, I think we're about out of time. I, I certainly want to thank you for visiting with us. Hey, no sweat. Do you have any words of advice? You mean like how to remove chewing gum from a suede garment, something like that? No, I mean spiritual advice. Well, I don't know how spiritual it is, but I'd say one thing is don't give your money to the church. They should be giving their money to you. Well, thank you, Jesus, and good night. Well, good night. Thanks for having me on here today. And by the way, in case anyone is interested, Bell Bottoms will be coming back in the year 2015. Ciao! The American Businessman's 10 Steps to Product Development Can I cut corners in the design? Can it be shoddily built? Can I use cheap materials? Will it create hazards for my workers? Will it harm the environment? Can I evade the safety laws? Will children die from it? Can I overprice it? Can it be falsely advertised? Will it force smaller competitors out of business? Excellent. Let's get busy, men. In the expression topsy-turvy, what exactly is meant by turvy? I'm curious, what precisely is Zsa, Zsa Gabor's job title? If free trade can really turn all these third world countries into thriving economies full of entrepreneurs and investors, who's going to clean the fucking toilets around here?
If it requires a uniform, it's a worthless endeavor. True stuff. There's actually a TV commercial in Las Vegas that advertises a service called Discount Bankruptcy. There is now a Starbucks in my pants. Here's an odd fact. When two women with different colored hair walk together on the sidewalk, the one with the darker hair will always be positioned closest to the curb. Tennis tip. You get a better return of serve if you let the ball bounce twice before hitting it. I think people on a diet should have a salad dressing called 250 Islands. Can anyone explain to me the need for one-hour photo finishing? You just saw the fucking thing. How can you possibly be nostalgic about a concept like a little while ago? When I was a boy, on Good Friday in my parish, in order to dramatize the extent of Jesus' suffering, a group of the priests used to get together and crucify one of the children. By and large, language is a tool for concealing the truth. What is all this shit about Dick Clark not looking his age? Take a closer look. You know my favorite play in baseball? The bean ball. It's great, isn't it? It's dramatic, especially if the guy is really hurt. Sometimes the ball hits the helmet and you feel kind of disappointed, even though it makes a good loud noise. Do you ever open the dictionary right to the page you want? Doesn't that feel good? Here's my idea for another one of those reality-based TV shows. No survivors. One by one, a psychopathic serial killer tracks down and kills all of the survivor survivors. Think of it as a public service. As far as I'm concerned, humans have not yet come up with a belief worth believing. People get all upset about torture, but when you get right down to it, it's really a pretty good way of finding out something a person doesn't want you to know. How soon can we begin to execute these yuppie half-wits who name their golden retrievers Jake and put red bandanas around their necks? Apparently this is viewed as amusing or ironic or some other quality yuppies value highly. It isn't amusing. It's precious half-wit bullshit. They say only 10% of the brain's function is known. Apparently, the function of the remaining 90% is to keep us from discovering its function. Ethnic-wise, I'll tell you this. If I hadn't turned out to be Irish, I would have really liked to be a guinea. You know the good part about all those executions in Texas? Fewer Texans. I'm tired of hearing about innocent victims. It's fiction. If you live on this planet, you're guilty, period, fuck you, next case, end of report. Your birth certificate is proof of guilt. Do you ever get that strange feeling of vujade? Not deja vu, vujade. It's the distinct sense that somehow something that just happened has never happened before. Nothing seems familiar. And then suddenly the feeling is gone. Vuja Day. Spirituality, the last refuge of a failed human. Just another way of distracting yourself from who you really are. I have a problem with these married yuppies who carry their babies in backpacks or front packs or slings or whatever these devices are called, these baby-carrying devices that seem designed to leave the parents' hands free to sort through merchandise. Hey, Mr. and Mrs. Natural Fibers, is it too much trouble to ask you to hold the fucking kid? Are you so busy picking out consumer goods and reaching for your credit card that you can't hold the baby? It's not an accessory. It's not a small appliance. It's a baby. Most of the time, people feel okay. It's probably because at that moment, they're not actually dying. You know what I like about the American form of government? They've worked things out so that you're never far from a 7-Eleven. I just realized I haven't eaten an ice cream sandwich in 47 years. I've never been quarantined, but the more I look around, the more I think it might not be such a bad thing. Here's some fun. Run into a bakery and ask if they can bake a cake in the shape of a penis. They're never quite sure. They always have to have a meeting. Well, I don't know. Wait, just a moment. Well, while they're talking, pull out your schwantz and wave it all around. Good Lord, Helen, quick, order more flour. I don't think we should be governing ourselves. What we need is a king. And every now and then, if the king's not doing a good job, we kill him. 
So far, this is the oldest I've ever been. You know, I think someone could make a lot of money if they set up a little stand at the Grand Canyon and sold yo-yos with 500-foot strings. Road rage, air rage. Why should I be forced to divide my rage into separate categories? To me, it's just one big all-around everyday rage. I don't have time for fine distinctions. I'm busy screaming at people. There's something I like about the clitoris, but I can't quite put my finger on it. Driving is fun, isn't it? Did you ever run over a guy, huh? And then you panic, so you back up and run over him again? Did you ever notice the second crunch is not as loud as the first? I think it's because the guy already has tread marks on him. But there he is, lying right in front of your car. Hey, might as well run over him again. What are you going to do this time, drive around him? When Ronald Reagan got Alzheimer's disease, how could they tell? Sometimes they say the winds are calm. Well, if they're calm, they're not really winds, are they? I think a good title for a travel book would be Doorway to Norway. Next time they give you all that civic bullshit about voting, keep in mind that Hitler was elected in a full free democratic election. Murder investigators say that in most cases, husbands kill wives, wives kill husbands, children kill parents, and parents kill children. Thank God for a little sanity in the world. Regarding the Boy Scouts, I'm very suspicious of any organization that has a handbook. If there really are multiple universes, what do they call the thing they're all a part of? Instead of warning pregnant women not to drink, I think female alcoholics ought to be told not to fuck. When I was a kid, I was a fussy eater. That's what they called it at our house. He's a fussy eater! Fussy eater is a euphemism for big pain in the ass. They'd trot out some food and I'd say, I don't like that. Why? I don't know. I know I don't like it. And I know that if I ate it, I would like it even less. Well, I like it. Mmm, yum, yum. Hey, Ma, you like it? You eat it. Sometimes they would try to corner me with logic. Well, how do you know you don't like it if you've never even tried it? It came to me in a dream. Big pain in the ass. Some things I didn't like because of the way they sounded. Don't sound right to me, Ma. Say that again. Asparagus. Nah, I don't like that. Imagine, I got away with that shit for eight or nine years. To this day, there are still some things I won't eat because of how they sound. Yogurt sounds disgusting. Yogurt. I can't eat anything that has both a Y and a G in it. Squash is also badly named. You want some squash? Sounds like someone sat on dinner. How would you like a nice tongue sandwich? It's made from slices of a cow's tongue. Hey, Ma, are you fucking trying to make me sick? There are also some foods that sound too funny to eat, like guacamole. Sounds like something you yell when you're on fire. Holy guacamole, my ass is burning. Or when you can't remember the name of something. Ed, where's that little guacamole that plugs into the lamp? Another food too funny to eat, garbanzo beans. Sounds like acrobats. Ladies and gentlemen, from Corsica, the fabulous garbanzos. On the other hand, there were some foods I didn't like because of how they looked. That seems a bit more rational. I don't like that. Don't look right to me. Did you make that, Ma? Is there a picture of it in the cookbook? I bet it don't look like that. Of course, some people will eat anything, no matter how it looks. I saw guys like that on the chow line in the army. Hi, boys, what do you got? I'll eat anything. What's that called? Never mind, give me a whole bunch of it. That's rat's asshole, Don. Well, it sure makes a hell of a fondue. Not me. I don't eat anything I don't recognize immediately. If I have to ask questions, I pass. I'm not at dinner to make inquiries. Give me something I can recognize, like a carrot. I know I can trust a carrot. Now, there are some foods that even though I know what they are, I still don't like their looks. Tomatoes, for instance. My main problem with tomatoes is that they don't look as though they're fully developed. They look like they're still in the larval stage. Thousands of tiny seeds and a whole lot of jelly-looking slime. Get it off my plate! It's slimy! 
It's like that stuff at the end of an egg. Of course, I know it's not the end of an egg. It's the beginning of a chicken. It's hand cum. Ah! Get it off my plate. Oh, I'm fun in the coffee shop. Lobsters and crabs don't look like food to me either. Anything with big pinchers crawling toward me sideways doesn't make me hungry. In fact, my instinct is step on that fuck. Step on him before he gets to the children. And I definitely cannot eat oysters. Not for the usual reason, their similarity to snot, but because when I look at the whole oyster, I think, hey, that's a little house. Somebody lives in there. I'm not going to break in on a guy just to have a meal. He might be making a pearl. Maybe he just brought home a do-it-yourself pearl kit and cleared off the dining room table. Who am I to interfere with the plans of an oyster? What wine goes with Captain Crunch? I have trouble selecting a wine in the morning. Sometimes I give up, smoke a bong full of Fruit Loops, and just go back to bed. Try that sometime. Smoke a bong full of Fruit Loops. Go back to bed and watch the mid-morning movie. Call your boss. Tell him you smoked some Fruit Loops, you're watching a movie, and you'll be in around 2.30. That is, if you feel like it. That's the way you handle a boss, you know. You can't take shit from someone just because you work for him. Let him know who the real boss is. Tell him it's your job and you'll do it your way. That's what bosses like. People with spunk. Act the same way when you go in for a job interview. Let them know what kind of a person you are. Have a beer opener and some swizzle sticks sticking out of your breast pocket. Put a little confetti in your hair. Tell them your primary career is partying and work is kind of a sideline. Tell the interviewer you'll need an office near the front door so you can leave in a hurry at 5 o'clock. I ain't sticking around this fucking place after hours, I'll tell you that right now. Let them know what's happening. Tell them you hope it's not one of those chicken shit places where they dock your pay just for taking off Mondays and Fridays. Then, if you still don't have the job, point to the picture on his desk and say, Who's the cunt? That'll clinch it. You'll probably have a nice long career with that firm once all your medical procedures have been completed. The butter warmer in the refrigerator is a strange invention. Originally, humans were cold, so they built a warm enclosure, a house. Cold outside, warm inside the house. Everything was fine until they realized that inside the warm enclosure, the meat tended to spoil. So they built a cold enclosure, a refrigerator, inside the warm enclosure. Warm in the house, cold in the refrigerator. Everything was fine until they realized that inside the cold enclosure, the butter got too hard to spread. So they built an even smaller warm enclosure, a butter warmer, inside the cold enclosure, which was already inside the larger warm enclosure. Strange. <laughs> Have you ever been in one of those serious social situations when you suddenly realize you have to pull the underwear out of the crack in your ass? Do you, Enrique, take this woman, Blanca, to be your lawful wedded wife? Huh? Hold on, Rev. Ah, ah, oh, I got it. Jesus, that was in deep. Yeah, 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 yes, I do, of course. Excuse me, Rev. Sometimes my shorts get sucked up way inside my asshole. Ain't love grand? <laughs> Have you ever been at a really loud party where the music is deafening and in order to be heard you have to scream at the top of your lungs even if you're talking to the person right next to you? But then often the music stops suddenly and everyone quiets down at the same time and only your voice can be heard ringing across the room. Charlie, I'm going to have my testicles laminated. And everyone turns to look at Charlie's interesting friend. <laughs> Have you ever been talking to a bunch of guys and you laugh through your nose and blow a snot on your shirt and then you have to just kind of keep talking and hope they think it's part of the design? Works all right if you're wearing a Hawaiian shirt, but otherwise they're going to notice. Hey, Ed, check it out. Dave's got a big snot on his shirt. Howie, look, Phil, come here. Dave just blew a big snot all over himself. Guys are such fun. <laughs> Do you ever meet a guy, and as you're shaking his hand, you realize he doesn't have a complete hand? It feels like something's missing, and you're standing there holding a handful of deformed, knob-like flesh? It's unnerving, isn't it? 
but you can't react. You can't even look down at his hand. You have to make believe it feels great. You can't go, ew, how creepy, where's your other fingers? You can't say that. It's not even an option. You have to hang in, smile big, and say, Hey, swell hand, give me three, okay, a high three, yo, okay. Have you ever been talking to yourself when someone suddenly comes in the room and you have to make believe you were actually singing? And you hope to God the other person really believes there's a song called Fuck Her? Most vitamin pills don't have names or trademarks on them. You know, they're just plain-looking, unmarked pills. And if you're traveling with a lot of vitamins, and in order to save space you put them all in one big jar, you have no way of proving what they are. If, for instance, the police should search your suitcase, all they're going to know is that you have a big jar of unmarked pills. And should they be in the mood to break your balls, they can hold you for 24 hours while they send these little things down to the lab and see what we've got here and you wind up in jail overnight for no reason at all. That's why I always travel with Flintstone vitamins. Not only do Flintstone vitamins contain all the vital nutrients kids need each day, they also keep grown-ups out of jail. Honest, officer, they're Flintstone vitamins. Look, there's Wilma and Barney. By God, Ben, he's right. Look at this. It's Dino. It's a little purple Dino. Suddenly, you're a free man. And a healthy one, too. Concerning the news coverage at the National Zoo, do you care if the pandas fuck? I don't. Why don't they stop telling us the pandas didn't fuck again this year? I'm not concerned. I have no emotional stake in panda fucking. If they want to, they will. If not, they'll watch The Price is Right. Probably the only reason the pandas aren't fucking on schedule is because some environmental jack-off has moved into the cage with them. Could you get a hard-on if some loser in a green t-shirt was taking your girlfriend's rectal temperature? Leave these creatures alone. And please, God, save the planet from environmentalists. Here's something else I'm getting tired of in this country. All this ignorant bullshit you have to listen to about children. It's all you hear anymore. Children, help the children, save the children, protect the children. You know what I say? Fuck the children. Fuck them. Fuck kids. They're getting entirely too much attention. And I know what some of you are thinking. You're saying, Jesus, he's not going to attack children, is he? Yes, he is. He's going to attack children. And remember, this is Mr. Conductor talking. I know what I'm talking about. And I also know that all of you boring single dads and working moms who think you're such fucking heroes aren't going to like this, but somebody's got to tell you for your own good. Your children are overrated and overvalued, and you've turned them into little cult objects. You have a child fetish, and it's not healthy. And I don't want to hear all that weak shit. Well, I love my children. Fuck you. Everybody loves their children. Doesn't make you special. John Wayne Gacy loved his children. Yes, he did. Kept them all right out in the yard near the garage. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is this constant mindless yammering in the media, this neurotic fixation, because that's all it is, that suggests somehow everything has to revolve around the lives of children. It's completely out of balance. Listen, there are a couple of things about kids you have to remember. Fine. First of all, they're not all cute, okay? In fact, if you look at them real close, most of them are rather unpleasant looking. And a lot of them don't smell too good either. Have you noticed the little ones in particular seem to have a kind of a sour milk and urine combination? I don't care for that at all. Stay with me on this, folks. The sooner you face it, the better off you're going to be. Second premise, not all children are smart and clever. Got that? Kids are like any other group of people. A few winners, a whole lot of losers. This country is filled with loser kids who simply aren't going anywhere. And there's nothing you can do about it. Nothing. You can't save them all. You can't do it, folks. You got to let them go. You got to cut them loose. You got to stop overprotecting them because you're making them too soft. Today's kids are way too soft. 
For one thing, there's too much emphasis on safety and safety equipment. Childproof medicine bottles and fireproof pajamas and child restraints in car seats and helmets. Bicycle, baseball, skateboard helmets. Kids have to wear helmets now for everything but jerking off. Grown-ups have taken all the fun out of being a kid just to save a few thousand lives. It's pathetic. It's fucking pathetic. What's happened is these baby boomers, these soft, fruity baby boomers have raised an entire generation of soft, fruity kids who aren't even allowed to have hazardous toys, for Christ's sakes. Hazardous toy shit. Whatever happened to natural selection? Survival of the fittest. The kid who swallows too many marbles doesn't grow up to have kids of his own. Simple stuff. Nature knows best. We're saving entirely too many lives in this country, of all ages. Nature should be permitted to do its job of weeding out and killing off the weak and sickly and ignorant people without interference from airbags and batting helmets. You're lowering the human gene pool. Just think of these ideas as passive eugenics. And here's another example of overprotection for these kids, and you've seen this on the news. Do you ever notice every time some guy with an AK-47 wanders into the schoolyard and kills three or four of these fucking kids and a couple of teachers, the next day the school is overrun with psychologists and psychiatrists and grief counselors and trauma therapists trying to help the children cope? Shit. When I was a kid, some guy came into our school and killed three or four of us. We went right on with our arithmetic. 35 classmates minus 4 equals 31. We were tough. I say if a kid can handle the violence at home, he ought to be able to handle the violence at school. Here's another bunch of ignorant bullshit about your children. School uniforms. Bad theory. The idea that if kids wear uniforms to school, it helps keep order. Hey, don't these schools do enough damage making all these children think alike? Now they're going to get them to look alike, too? And it's not even a new idea. I first saw it in old newsreels from the 1930s, but it was hard to understand because the narration was in German. But the uniforms looked beautiful. And the children, the children did everything they were told in Germany, and they never questioned authority. Gee, I wonder why someone would want to put our children in uniforms. Can't imagine. The one more item about children, and that is this superstitious nonsense that blames tobacco companies for kids who smoke. Listen. Kids don't smoke because a camel in sunglasses tells them to. They smoke for the same reasons you do, because it's an enjoyable activity that relieves anxiety and depression. And you'd be anxious and depressed, too, if you had to put up with these pathetic, insecure, striving, anal, yuppie parents who enroll you in college before you're old enough to know which side of the playpen smells the worst, and then they fill you full of Ritalin, fill you full of drugs to get you in a mood they approve of, and drag you all over town in search of empty, meaningless structure. Little League, Cub Scouts, swimming, soccer, karate, piano, bagpipes, dildo practice, I don't know what they're doing. They even have play dates, for Christ's sakes. Playing is now done by appointment. Whatever happened to you show me your wee-wee and I'll show you mine? You never hear that anymore. But a lot of these parents are burning their kids out on structure. I say what every child needs and ought to have every day is two hours of daydreaming. Just daydreaming. Turn off the computer games, the CD-ROMs, and the internet, and just let them stare at a tree for a couple hours. It's good for them. And every now and then they actually come up with one of their own ideas. You want to know how you can help your children? Leave them the fuck alone. Do you ever eat a whole box of cookies right in a row? Do you ever do that? I don't mean take them into your bedroom or something. I mean open them right up in the kitchen as soon as you get home from the store and eat them while you're standing there. Just stare at the toaster while you're eating a whole goddamn box of cookies. Do you ever do that? Isn't it great? And do you ever notice that printed right on the cookie box it says, Open here? Well, what did they think I was going to do? Move to Hong Kong to open up their fucking cookies? Of course I'm going to open them here. I'm going to eat them here. I'd almost have to open them here. Thank God it doesn't say open somewhere else. I'd be up all night trying to figure out an appropriate location. (laughs) 
Here's an embarrassing driving situation, the kind of thing that can haunt you for several hundred miles. One of those incidents you can't just shake off. Like the time you almost got killed by the big tractor trailer and had to pull off the road for about 20 minutes and listen to your heart slamming up against your rib cage. Bam, 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 bam. Well, this next thing is just like that, but this is one you do all by yourself. Do you ever pull up to a red light and you go a little bit too far into the intersection, just a few extra feet? So you put the car in reverse and you back up just a little bit and then you forget the car is in reverse. So you sit there, innocently, waiting for the light to change, looking around, eager to get moving again. Don't want to keep the proctologist waiting. At this point, folks, you are truly an accident waiting to happen. An insurance claim in progress. So you sit some more, and you sit some more, and you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and you stare at the red light, and you look over at the woman on the right adjusting her tits, and you look at the guy on the left picking his nose, and then finally, finally the light changes and off you go. Crash, crumple, tinkle, crunch. Directly backward into the grill of what was formerly a cute little red Yugo. Holy shit, how'd I get back here? This is where I was a couple of minutes ago. Apparently, you have to pay attention even at the red lights. I thought surely they were for resting. You know, drive a little, rest a little, drive a little, rest a little. Seemed that way to me. Guess not. Here's a little red light story that somebody told me a long time ago. This guy's driving along, and he's got someone sitting right next to him in the passenger seat, and he goes straight through a red light. Zoom! Passenger says, what are you doing? Driver says, never mind, my brother drives like this. They go a little farther, they come to another red light, zoom, guy goes right through it. What are you doing? Will you stop? I told you my brother drives like this. Keeps on going, and now he comes to a green light, and he slams on the brakes. What are you doing? Well, you never know. My brother might be coming the other way. Now, a couple of things to remember when you're out in traffic. First of all, never get behind anybody weird. You ever get behind a guy whose turn signal has been on for about 80 miles? And you're thinking to yourself, well, maybe he's just a really cautious man. I'm not going to pass him now. He may turn at any moment. And later you discover he was driving around the world to the left. Another pain in the ass you don't want to get behind is anyone who's driving real slow. Boy, that's good for your arteries, isn't it? Someone who's really, really slow. There are two classes of driver in this category. The first is any four-foot woman in a Cadillac whose head you cannot see. This is certain death. At first you think, well, maybe it's a remote-controlled experimental robot car. No, I can see tiny knuckles on the wheel and a small patch of blue hair. At this point, folks, I take no chances. I pull over immediately and take public transportation. I'm not about to fuck with a ghost car. Let someone else flag down the Flying Dutchman. It's not my job. Another driver you don't want to get behind is any man over 70 wearing a flannel cap with earlaps in August. Keep your distance, because folks, you know how pissed you can get. Even though you think you're a mighty cool customer, you do get mighty pissed out there. Don't you occasionally wish that instead of having headlights, you had a couple of 50 caliber machine guns on the front of your car so you could send several hundred rounds of burning lead into that slow-moving gas guzzler up ahead, just incinerate the motherfucker and get his ass off the road permanently? Why well, don't you wish you were driving a rental car so you could bash the asshole in the rear end, pay the deductible, and be done with the whole goddamn thing? Bam! 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 Don't mind me, folks. I'm just trying to ease him up into second gear. Bam! God, it would do my heart good. Or if the offender is directly behind you, wouldn't it be nice to have an electronic message board that would rise up out of the trunk of your car and let you type in any message you like? Attention, asshole. You drive like old people fuck. Slow and sloppy. Speaking of behind you, don't you just love it when there's one of those guys on your tail whose brights are on? Isn't that a treat? Some shit stain who just had his headlights aimed and wants you to see what a wonderful job his mechanic did. You know how you handle a guy like that? Slam on your brakes and let him plow right into you. Might cost you a little money, but it sure puts them fucking lights out in a hurry. Let him find his way home in the dark. 
Does this ever happen to you? You're driving through heavy downtown traffic, block to block, street to street, busy area, people hurrying home at five o'clock. Maybe it's winter and it's already dark, raining a little bit. You got the window open and you can hear the rain and the traffic noise, people honking at each other, got the radio on, got the windshield wipers going, everything's happening at once. Radio, rain, wipers, horns, traffic, lots of noise, and you're just trying to get across town to run an errand. And then, after all kinds of hassles, you get over there and you park the car, turn off the key, go inside and take care of business. And then when you come back out to the car and you turn on the key, the goddamn radio is this loud! And you sit there stunned, thinking to yourself, could I possibly have been listening to that? Here's one of those things you have to do every time you drive, especially if you're in a hurry. It happens as you approach a red light and find several lanes of cars ahead of you. As you roll up to the pack, you have to decide which lane to get into. You have to guess which car looks like a good bet to take off quickly so you can move out fast when the light turns green. With a half a block to go, you have to decide who's the really fast asshole in this group up ahead. Forget the Volvo. She's listening to public radio and drives the way she lives, with fear and caution. You'll also want to avoid that Toyota with the fish symbol. Christians drive as though Jesus himself was a traffic cop. And by all means, ignore the Lexus with the heavily made-up, bejeweled pig woman. She has the reflexes of an aging panda. Ah, here's the correct machine to get behind. A Camaro with four different shades of primer paint and a bumper sticker that says, I date my sister. This guy's a real risk taker, full of crank and on his way to an ACDC concert. You'll be home before you know it. Now, one last reminder before I tow this trusty little shitbox of mine into the shop for its bi-monthly overhaul, and this should go without saying. That's why I'm going to say it. Drinking and driving don't mix. Do your drinking early in the morning and get it out of the way, then go out driving while the visibility is still good. Here's some fun. Stand on line at the bank for a really long time. Then when you finally get up to the window, just ask for a change of a nickel. It's fun. They actually call other tellers over to look at you. Regarding Pokemon and Beanie Babies and Cabbage Patch Dolls and such, something is really wrong when a major news story concerns how hard it is to buy a toy. I don't know about you, but I'm getting pretty sick of these church people. You know what they ought to do with churches? Tax them. Tax them. If holy people are so interested in politics, government, and public policy, let them pay the price of admission like everybody else. The Catholic Church alone could wipe out the national debt if all you did was tax their real estate. Whenever I see a large crowd of people, I always wonder how many of them will eventually require autopsies. Laptop. How can this be? A lap has no top. It has only two dimensions, length and width. It's not like a desk. A desk has a bottom, a top, and sides. You place your desktop on the top of your desk. A lap has only one plane. When you stand up, your lap disappears, and your computer becomes a floor top. Everything beeps now. I think there ought to be a feminine hygiene spray called Sprunt. Think of how strange we'd look if all the cuts, burns, scrapes, bruises, scratches, bumps, gashes, and scabs we've ever had suddenly reappeared on our bodies at the same time. Regarding jam sessions, jazz musicians are the only workers I can think of who are willing to put in a full shift for pay and then go somewhere else and continue working for free. When someone asks you what time it is, glance at your watch and say, well, it's either 6.15 or Mickey has a hard on Guaranteed they'll ask someone else. Griddle cakes, pancakes, hot cakes, flapjacks. Why are there four names for grilled batter and only one word for love? I noticed that unlike on other holidays, the police don't seem to make a big deal about drunk driving on Good Friday. Why is that? You know what I never liked? The high five. I consider it lame white boy shit. When a guy raises his arm to give me a high five, you know what I do? Stab him in the arm. I'm tired of that shit. Sometimes I watch an old sports film on ESPN Classic and I see a whole game without a single high five. It's great. When you think about it, 
12.15 p.m. is actually 11.75 a.m. At one time, there existed a race of people whose knowledge consisted entirely of gossip. A crazy person doesn't really lose his mind. It just becomes something more entertaining. Instead of having truck scales on the highway, I think they ought to get one of those guys from the carnival and let him guess the weights. An art thief is a man who takes pictures. You know a phrase I never understood? King size. It's used to denote something larger. But most of the kings you see are short. You ever notice that? Usually a king is a short little fat guy. You never see a tall king. When's the last gangly king you can remember? Everywhere you look, there are families with too many vehicles. You see them on the highways in their RVs. But apparently the RVs aren't enough, because behind them, they're towing motorboats, go-karts, dune buggies, dirt bikes, jet skis, snowmobiles, parasails, hang gliders, hot air balloons, and small two-man deep-sea diving bells. The only thing these people lack is lunar excursion modules. Doesn't anybody take a fucking walk anymore? The older a person gets, the less they care what they wear. Old people come up with some of the strangest clothing combinations you'll ever see. I think of it as cancer of the clothing. We're not supposed to mention fucking in mixed company, but that's exactly where it takes place. The other day I was thinking of how many peanuts elephants owe us. Personally, I'm down about 23 or 24 bags. If it's true that our species is alone in the universe, then I'd have to say the universe aimed rather low and settled for very little. I'm getting tired of all this security at the airport. There's too much of it. I'm tired of some fat chick with a double-digit IQ and a triple-digit income rooting around inside of my bag for no reason and never finding anything. They haven't found anything yet in anybody's bag. Haven't found one bomb in one bag. And don't tell me, well, the terrorists know their bags are going to be searched, so now they're leaving their bombs at home. There are no bombs. The whole thing is fucking pointless. And it's completely without logic. There's no logic at all. They'll take away a gun, but let you keep a knife. Well, what the fuck is that? In fact, there's a whole list of lethal objects they will allow you to take on board. Theoretically, you could take a knife, an ice pick, a hatchet, a straight razor, a pair of scissors, a chainsaw, six knitting needles, and a broken whiskey bottle, and the only thing they'd say to you is, that bag has to fit all the way under the seat in front of you. And if you didn't take a weapon on board, relax. After you've been flying for about an hour, they're going to bring you a knife and fork. They actually give you a fucking knife. It's only a table knife, but you could kill a pilot with a table knife. Might take you a couple of minutes, you know, especially if he's hefty. But you could get the job done if you really wanted to kill a prick. Shit, there's a lot of things you could use to kill a guy with. You could probably beat a guy to death with the Sunday New York Times. Or suppose you just had really big hands. Couldn't you strangle a flight attendant? Shit, you could probably strangle two of them, one with each hand. You know, if you were lucky enough to catch them in that little kitchen area, just before they break out to fucking peanuts. But you could get the job done, if you really cared enough. So why is it they allow a man with big, powerful hands to get on board an airplane? I'll tell you why. They know he's not a security risk because he's already answered the three big questions. Question number one, did you pack your bags yourself? No, Carrot Top packed my bags. He and Martha Stewart and Florence Henderson came over to the house last night, fixed me a lovely lobster Newberg, gave me a full body massage with sacred oils from India, performed a four-way around the world, and then they packed my bags. Next question. Have your bags been in your possession the whole time? No. Usually the night before I travel, just as the moon is rising, I place my suitcases out on the street corner and leave them there unattended for several hours, just for good luck. Next question. Has any unknown person asked you to take anything on board? Hmm. Well, what exactly is an unknown person? Surely everyone is known to someone. In fact, just this morning, Karim and Yusef Ali Ben Gaba seemed to know each other quite well. They kept joking about which one of my suitcases was the heaviest. And that's another thing they don't like at the airport. Jokes. 
You know, yeah, you can't joke about a bomb. Well, why is it just jokes? What about a riddle? How about a limerick? How about a bomb anecdote? You know, no punchline, just a really cute story. Or, suppose you intended the remark, not as a joke, but as an ironic musing. Are they prepared to make that distinction? Why, I think not. And besides, who's to say what's funny? Airport security is a stupid idea, it's a waste of money, and it's only there for one reason, to make white people feel safe. That's all, to provide the feeling, the illusion of safety, in order to placate the middle class. Because the authorities know they can't make airplanes safe. Too many people have access. You'll notice the drug smugglers don't seem to have a lot of trouble getting their little packages on board, do they? No, and God bless them too. And by the way, an airplane flight shouldn't be completely safe. You need a little danger in your life. Take a fucking chance once in a while, will you? What are you going to do, play with your prick for another 30 years? Eh? What, are you going to read People magazine and eat at Wendy's till the end of time? Take a fucking chance. Besides, even if they made all of the airplanes completely safe, the terrorists would simply start bombing other places that are crowded. Porn shops, crack houses, titty bars, and gangbangs. You know, entertainment venues. The odds of you being killed by a terrorist are practically zero. So I say relax and enjoy the show. You have to be realistic about terrorism. You gotta be a realist. Certain groups of people, Muslim fundamentalists, Christian fundamentalists, Jewish fundamentalists, and just plain guys from Montana are gonna continue to make life in this country very interesting for a long, long time. That's the reality. Angry men in combat fatigues talking to God on a two-way radio and muttering incoherent coherent slogans about freedom are eventually going to provide us with a great deal of entertainment, especially after your stupid fucking economy collapses all around you and the terrorists come out of the woodwork and you'll have anthrax in the water supply, there'll be sarin gas in the air conditioners, there'll be chemical and biological suitcase bombs in every city, and I say relax, enjoy the show, take a fucking chance, put a little fun into your life. To me, terrorism is exciting. I think the very idea that you can set off a bomb in Macy's and kill 800 people is exciting and stimulating, and I see it as a form of entertainment. I also know that most Americans are soft and frightened and unimaginative people who have no idea there's such a thing as dangerous fun, and they certainly don't recognize a good show when they see one. I have always been willing to put myself at great personal risk for the sake of entertainment, and I've always been willing to put you at great personal risk for the same reason. As far as I'm concerned, all of this airport security, the questions, the cameras, the screenings, the searches, it's just one more way of reducing your liberty and reminding you that they can fuck with you anytime they want, as long as you're willing to put up with it. Which means, of course, any time they want, because that's the way Americans are now. They're always willing to trade away a little of their freedom in exchange for the feeling, the illusion of security. What we have now is a completely neurotic population obsessed with security and safety and crime and drugs and cleanliness and hygiene and germs. <laughs> There's another thing, the fear of germs. Where did this sudden fear of germs come from in this country? Have you noticed this? The media constantly doing stories about all the latest infections. Salmonella, E. coli, hantavirus, bird flu. Now they have West Nile fever. And Americans panic easily, so now everybody's running around scrubbing this and spraying that and overcooking their food and repeatedly washing their hands, trying to avoid all contact with germs. It's ridiculous, and it goes to ridiculous lengths in prisons, and this is true, in prisons, before they give you a lethal injection, they swab your arm with alcohol. It's true. Well, they don't want you to get an infection. And you can see their point. Wouldn't want some guy to go to hell and be sick. It would take a lot of the sport out of the whole execution. 
Fear of germs. What a bunch of pussies. You can't even get a decent hamburger anymore. They cook the shit out of everything now because everybody's afraid of food poisoning. Hey, where's your sense of adventure? Take a fucking chance. You know how many people die from food poisoning in this country every year? 9,000, that's all. It's a minor risk. Take a fucking chance. Bunch of goddamn pussies. Besides... What do you think you have an immune system for? It's for killing germs. But it needs practice. It needs germs to practice on. So if you kill all the germs around you and live a completely sterile life, then when germs do come along, you're not going to be prepared. And never mind ordinary germs. What are you going to do when some super virus comes along that turns your vital organs into liquid shit? I'll tell you what you're going to do. You're going to get sick, you're going to die, and you're going to deserve it because you're fucking weak and you got a fucking weak immune system. Now, I'm going to tell you a true story about immunization. When I was a little boy in New York City in the 1940s, we swam in the Hudson River, and it was filled with raw sewage. Okay? We swam in raw sewage. You know, to cool off. And at that time, the big fear was polio. Thousands of kids died from polio every year. But you know something? In my neighborhood, no one ever got polio. No one. Ever. You know why? Because we swam in raw sewage. It strengthened our immune systems. The polio never had a prayer. We were tempered in raw shit. So personally, I never take any special precautions against germs. I don't shy away from people who sneeze and cough. I don't wipe off the telephone. I don't cover the toilet seat. And if I drop food on the floor, I pick it up and eat it. I eat it, even if I'm at a sidewalk cafe in Calcutta, the poor section, on New Year's morning during a soccer riot. And you know something? In spite of all of that so-called risky behavior, I never get infections, folks. I just don't get them. I don't get colds. I don't get flu. I don't get food poisoning. And I don't get headaches or upset stomachs. And you know why? Because I got a good, strong immune system, and it gets a lot of practice. My immune system is equipped with the biological equivalent of fully automatic military assault rifles with night vision and laser scopes. And we have recently acquired phosphorus grenades, cluster bombs, and anti-personnel fragmentation mines. So, when my white blood cells are on patrol, reconnoitering my bloodstream, seeking out strangers and other undesirables, if they see any, any suspicious-looking germs of any kind, they don't fuck around. They whip out the weapons, wax the motherfucker, and deposit the unlucky fellow directly into my colon. Directly into my colon. There's no nonsense. There's no Miranda warning. There's none of that three strikes and you're out shit. First offense, bam, into the colon you go. And speaking of my colon, I want you to know I don't automatically wash my hands every time I go to the bathroom. Can you deal with that? Sometimes I do. Sometimes I don't. You know when I wash my hands? When I shit on them. That's the only time. And you know how often that happens? Tops. Tops. Two, three times a week. Tops. Maybe a little more frequently over the holidays. You know what I mean? And I'll tell you something else, my well-scrubbed friends. You don't always need a shower every day. Did you know that? It's overkill. Unless you work out, or work outdoors, or for some reason come in intimate contact with huge amounts of filth and garbage every day, you don't always need a shower. All you really need to do is to wash the four key areas. Armpits, asshole, crotch, and teeth. Got that? The hooker's bath. Armpits, asshole, crotch, and teeth. In fact, you can save yourself a whole lot of time if you simply use the same brush on all four areas. Do you ever wonder who empties the wishing wells? That's our money. I've never received an accounting. It's just gone. Someone, apparently, is emptying the wishing wells and keeping the money. And I'm wondering whether or not that cancels out the wishes. I mean, suppose it's a wish that takes time to come true. Like if you wish some friend of yours would develop cancer. That takes time. How can it come true if your nickel has already been rolled in a wrapper and deposited in a bank? And by the way, when does this coin retrieval take place? I'm sure they don't do it on Sunday afternoon. As some little girl is tossing in a penny wishing for her daddy to come back from heaven. No, they probably do it at three in the morning wearing black t-shirts and ski masks. I think this has gone far enough. 
I want to know what's going on. My friend is still perfectly healthy, and I'm concerned. You know, they use sex to sell things on TV commercials. Why can't they use violence and bad language, too? Not all families are as functional as the ones they show you on TV. Eat your fucking cornflakes, you cocksucker! Fuck you, ma! Why, you little creep! Slam! Smack! Pow! Here, son, try this. It's new from Kellogg's. Holy shit, Dad! Raisins! Hey, asshole! What are you trying to do? Spoil the kid? Listen, cunt, I'm tired of your meddling. Blam! Pow! Crack! Hey, Dad, when you get finished punching Mom, give me some more of that shit with the raisins in it, would ya? Dogs have no priorities or schedules. You rarely see a dog with a wristwatch. Most things they do, they will do anywhere at any time, except for the things you teach them not to do. Laszlo, don't ever do that again. If you do, I'll beat the shit out of you. They do catch on to suggestions like that. But basically, a dog doesn't care what he does. He'll simply do whatever's next. He doesn't really know what's next, but he'll think of something. He might even do two things in a row that don't go together. Did you ever see a dog trotting through a room, apparently headed somewhere, and suddenly he stops and chews his back for about eight minutes, as if the whole thing were scheduled for that exact moment? And then finally, when he's finished chewing, he forgets where he was going in the first place and just sort of looks around, confused. Let's see, where was I going? Oh, shit, I forget. Seemed important at the time. Well, I guess I'll just lie down here under this chair. Hey, it's nice under here. I must do this more often. He doesn't know, and he doesn't care. Like I say, he'll do anything at any time. He might even embarrass you when you have company. You might have some folks over to the house, you know, folks you don't know that well, people you're trying to impress. Hell, you might even be trying to borrow money from one of these assholes. And all these people are sitting around the living room, and you've put out some chips and a little dip, carrot sticks, maybe a little light buffet, and everybody's eating nicely and chatting politely, and the dog is lying there on the floor in full view. And suddenly, you glance over and realize that the dog is licking his balls. Vigorously. Big, long, loving licks in full view of everyone. And no one is saying a word. Remember, a spectacular thing is taking place. A naked living creature is administering a modified form of autofellatio in the presence of strangers. Not only is it a spectacular act, it's difficult to do. If I could do that, I'd never leave the house. And yet it goes unremarked. And if someone does say something, it's usually innocuous. Look, isn't he cute? He's taking a bath. No, Carla, that's not a bath. That's called licking your balls. If that's a bath, I'd have to say it's a mighty selective bath. He's been on that one spot for over an hour now. Then the dog trots over and starts to lick your face. No, 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 Bruno. No, down, down, Bruno. Nice doggy. Oh, don't worry about it. Don't you know they have the cleanest mouth of any animal? Well, I'm not a chemist, Velma. I'm just basing my judgment on his most recent activity, which, as you'll recall, was licking his balls. Here are some things you can do just for fun. When writing a letter of reference for a friend, give him a glowing recommendation. But just for fun, conclude by saying, don't let Dave's legal history trouble you. There's reason to believe the little girl was lying. Just for fun, knock on the door of any stall in a public restroom and say, Sir, please, try to control the smell in there. Don't force us to bring in the hoses. Call one of those How Am I Driving 800 numbers and just for fun, complain about a particular driver. Tell them he was driving on the sidewalk, vomiting, giving the finger to old women and dangling a baby out the window. Next time you're at a baseball game, sing the national anthem in a loud voice. But just for fun, alternate each line between English and complete gibberish. 
Oh, say, can you see Floggy Bloom Skeldo Prunk? What so proudly we hailed Clog a drunk slurn clam dung blench. See if that doesn't get the fans talking among themselves. While strolling past a sidewalk cafe, just for fun, squeeze off several truly repulsive farts, silent or noisy. If silent, stand to one side and watch the results. If noisy, tip your hat and say, Bon Appetito. Walk through a crowded amusement park carrying a small tape recorder that plays the sound of a little girl's voice screaming, Help, Mommy! The man is touching me like Daddy does at home! You know, just for fun. Camcorders are a good example of technology gone berserk. Everywhere you go now, you see some goofy fuck with a camcorder. Everyone's taping everything. Doesn't anybody stop and look at things anymore? Take them in? Maybe even remember them? Is that such a strange idea? Does experience really have to be documented, brought home, and saved on a shelf? And do people really watch this shit? Are people's lives so bankrupt they sit at home watching things they already did? And these guys are so intense. And by the way, it's always guys. They won't let women touch the cameras. It's a highly technical skill. Look through a hole, push on a button. Big fucking skill. And they all think they're Federico Fellini. Did you ever see them at the soccer games with the low angles and the zooms and the pans? And it's the same three ugly children in every shot. Same kids. Believe me, all the George Lucas magic in Hollywood is not going to change the unfortunate genetic configurations on the faces of these children. Do the world a favor. Keep these unfortunate youngsters indoors out of public view. To my way of thinking, there are really only three sports. Baseball, basketball, and football. Everything else is either a game or an activity. Hockey comes to mind. People think hockey is a sport. It's not. Hockey is three activities taking place at the same time. Ice skating, fooling around with a puck, and beating the shit out of somebody. If these guys had more brains than teeth, they'd do these things one at a time. First you go ice skating, then you fool around with a puck. Then you go to the bar and beat the shit out of somebody. The day would last longer, and these guys would have a whole lot more fun. Another reason hockey is not a sport is that it's not played with a ball. Anything not played with a ball can't be a sport. These are my rules. I make them up. Soccer. Soccer's not a sport because you can't use your arms. Anything where you can't use your arms can't be a sport. Tap dancing isn't a sport. I rest my case. Running. People think running is a sport. Running isn't a sport because anybody can do it. Anything we can all do can't be a sport. I can run. You could run. For Christ's sakes, my mother can run. You don't see her on the cover of Sports Illustrated, do you? And swimming isn't a sport. Swimming is a way to keep from drowning. That's just common sense. Sailing? Sailing isn't a sport. Sailing is a way to get somewhere. Riding the bus isn't a sport. Why the fuck should sailing be a sport? And boxing is not a sport either. Boxing is a way to beat the shit out of somebody. In that respect, boxing is actually a more sophisticated form of hockey. In spite of what the police tell you, beating the shit out of somebody is not a sport. When police brutality becomes an Olympic event, fine. Then boxing can be a sport. Bowling isn't a sport because you have to rent the shoes. Don't forget, these are my rules. I make them up. Billiards. Some people think billiards is a sport, but it can't be because there's no chance for serious injury. Unless, of course, you welch on a bet in a tough neighborhood. Then, if you wind up with a pool cue sticking out of your ass, you know you just might be the victim of a sports-related injury. But that ain't billiards, that's pool. And that starts with a P, and that rhymes with D, and that brings me to darts. Darts could have been a sport because at least there's a chance to put someone's eye out. But alas, darts will never be a sport because the whole object of the game is to reach zero, which goes against all sports logic. Lacrosse is not a sport. Lacrosse is a faggoty college activity. I don't care how rough it is, any time you're running around a field waving a stick with a little net on the end of it, you're engaged in a faggoty college activity. Period. Same thing for field hockey and fencing. Faggoty college shit. Also, these activities aren't sports because you can't gamble on them. Anything you can't gamble on can't be a sport. When was the last time you made a fucking fencing bet? And gymnastics is not a sport because Romanians are good at it. 
took me a long time to come up with that rule, but God damn it, I did it. Polo isn't a sport. Polo is golf on horseback, without the holes. It's a great concept, but it's not a sport. And as far as water polo is concerned, I hesitate to even mention it because it's extremely cruel to the horses. Which brings me to hunting. You think hunting is a sport? Ask the deer. The only good thing about hunting is the many fatal accidents on the weekends. And of course, the permanently disfigured hunters who survive such accidents. Then you have tennis. Tennis is very trendy and very fruity, but it's not a sport. It's just a way to meet other trendy fruits. Technically, tennis is an advanced form of ping pong. In fact, tennis is ping pong played while standing on the table. Great concept, not a sport. In fact, all racket games are nothing more than derivatives of ping pong. Even volleyball is technically racketless team ping pong played with an inflated ball and a raised net while standing on the table. And finally, we come to golf. For my full take on golf, I refer you elsewhere in this recording. But let it just be said, golf is a game that might possibly be fun if it could be played alone. But it's the vacuous, striving, superficial, male-bonding joiners one has to associate with that makes it such a repulsive pastime. And it is decidedly not a sport. Period. Here's a word you don't see anymore. Foodstuffs. I wish it would make a comeback. I like that. Foodstuffs. Let's give credit where credit is due and admit that Scotch tape was a really great idea. You live 80 years, and at best, you get about six minutes of pure magic. True fact, there are 11 teams in the Big Ten. You know, sometimes when you're burying a guy alive, for a moment or two you start feeling sorry for him, and then it passes and you keep on shoveling. I think everyone should treat one another in a Christian manner. I will not, however, be responsible for the consequences. I wonder if an Elvis impersonator could ever get famous enough so that someone who looked like him could become a celebrity look-alike. Do you think there's room in this culture for an Elvis impersonator look-alike? Probably. One objection to cloning human beings is that there's a chance for abnormal offspring. Yeah? So, you ever take a look at some of those families in the South? Why do they bother saying raw sewage? Do some people actually cook that stuff? You rarely run into a damsel anymore. Whenever I hear someone referred to as a spiritual leader, I wonder why the spirit world needs leaders. Here's more bullshit middle-brow philosophy. That which doesn't kill me makes me stronger. I got something a little more realistic for you. That which doesn't kill me still may sever my spinal cord, crush my rib cage, cave in my skull, and leave me helpless and paralyzed, soaking in a puddle of my own waste. Put that on your t-shirt, touchy-feely new age asshole. These days, many politicians are demanding change, just like the homeless people. Live and let live, that's what I always say. Anyone who can't understand that should be killed. It's a simple philosophy, but it's always worked well in our family. Hey, isn't it time we stopped wasting valuable land on cemeteries? Talk about an idea whose time has passed. Let's put all the dead people in boxes and keep them in one part of town. What kind of medieval bullshit is that? I say plow these motherfuckers up and throw them away. Or melt them down. We need that phosphorus for farming. If we're going to recycle, let's get serious. Did you notice Joan Rivers has turned into one of those people she used to make fun of? Something I really don't like is that claymation, you know? That stop-action animation junk. Why don't they can that shit? It's fake-looking, and it detracts from the story. <laughs> Every time you're exposed to advertising in America, you're reminded that this country's most profitable business is still the manufacture, packaging, distribution, and marketing of bullshit. High quality, grade A, prime cut, pure American bullshit. And the sad part is that most people seem to believe bullshit only comes from certain predictable sources. Advertising, politics, salesmen, lawyers, not true. Bullshit is everywhere. Bullshit is rampant. Parents are full of shit, teachers are full of shit, clergymen are full of shit, and law enforcement is full of shit. 
This entire country is completely full of shit and always has been. From the Declaration of Independence to the Constitution to the Star Spangled Banner, it's really nothing more than one big steaming pile of red, white, and blue all-American bullshit. Think of how it started. America was founded by slave owners who told us all men are created equal. All men, except Indians, niggers, and women. Remember, the founders were a small group of unelected white male land-holding slave owners who also, by the way, suggested their class be the only one allowed to vote. To my mind, that is what's known as being stunningly and embarrassingly full of shit. And everybody bought it. All Americans bought it. And those same Americans continue to show their ignorance with all this nonsense about wanting their politicians to be honest. What are these cretins thinking? Do they realize what they're wishing for? If honesty were suddenly introduced into American life, everything would collapse. It would destroy this country because our system is based on an intricate and delicately balanced system of lies. And I think that somehow, deep down, Americans understand this. That's why they elected and re-elected Bill Clinton. Because given a choice, Americans prefer their bullshit right out front where they can get a good, strong whiff of it. Clinton may have been full of shit, but at least he let you know it. And people like that. In 96, Dole tried to hide his bullshit, and he lost. He kept saying, I'm a plain and honest man. People don't believe that. What did Clinton say? He said, hi, folks, I'm completely full of shit, and how do you like that? And the people said, you know what? At least he's honest. At least he's honest about being completely full of shit. It's the same in the business world. Everyone knows by now, all businessmen are completely full of shit. Just the worst kind of low-life criminal cocksuckers you can expect to meet. And the proof is, they don't even trust each other. When a businessman sits down to negotiate with another businessman, the first thing he does is to assume the other guy is a complete lying prick who's trying to fuck him out of his money. So he does everything he can to fuck the other guy a little bit faster and a little bit harder. And he does it with a big smile on his face. That big bullshit businessman smile. And if you're a customer, that's when you get the really big smile. Customer always gets that really big smile as the businessman carefully positions himself directly behind the customer, unzips his pants, and proceeds to service the account. I'm servicing this account. Now you know what they mean when they say, we specialize in customer service. Whoever first said, let the buyer beware, was probably bleeding from the asshole. But that's business, that's business, and business is okay. But folks, I have to tell you, in the bullshit department, a businessman can't hold a candle to a clergyman. Because when it comes to bullshit, big time, major league bullshit, you have to stand in awe, in awe of the all-time champion of false promises and exaggerated claims, religion. No contest. Religion easily has the greatest bullshit story ever told. Think about it. Religion has actually convinced people, many of them adults, that there's an invisible man who lives in the sky and watches everything they do every minute of every day and has a special list of ten things he does not want you to do. And if you do any of these ten things, he has a special place full of fire and smoke and burning and torture and anguish where he will send you to remain and suffer and burn and choke and scream and cry forever and ever till the end of time. But he loves you. He loves you and he needs money. He always needs money. He's all-powerful, all-perfect, all-knowing and all-wise. Somehow, he just can't handle money. Religion takes in billions of dollars, pays no taxes, and somehow they always need a little more. Now, you talk about a good bullshit story. Holy shit. You're all going to die. I hate to remind you, but it is on your schedule. It probably won't happen when you'd like. Generally, it's an inconvenience. For instance, you might have your stamp collection spread out on the dining room table. Now? Now. May I at least put away my commemoratives? No. 
inconvenient. Nobody wants to die. Nobody. Well, maybe evil Knievel, but most other people don't like the idea. Doesn't seem like an enjoyable thing. People figure if being sick is no fun, dying must really be a bother. After all, part of the pleasure of being alive is the knowledge that you're not dead yet. And when you get right down to it, people don't mind being dead. It's getting dead that bothers them. No one wants to get dead, but we're all going to do it. Death is one of the few things that is really, truly democratic. Everybody gets it once, but only once. That's what makes us nervous. No rehearsals. And actually, I think people should look forward to death. After all, it's our next big adventure. At last, we're going to find out where we go. Isn't that what we've all been wondering? Where we go? Where do we go? I don't know. We must go somewhere. True. Phil says he knows. I know he does, but take my word, Phil doesn't know. Where do we go? Maybe it's nowhere. That would be interesting. On the one hand, you'd be nowhere, but on the other hand, you wouldn't know it. So at least you'd have something to think about. Or not. Personally, I think we go wherever we think we're going to go. What you think is what you get. Have you ever heard one of those guys who says, Don't even bother praying for me. I'm going straight to hell. I'm going to hell and be with all my friends. Well, he is. He's going to hell. And he'll probably be with all his friends. What you think is what you get. If you keep saying you're going to heaven, chances are you'll get there. But don't look for any of your friends. In my own case, I expect I'll be going to a public toilet in Honduras. And by the way, should you be interested, I can tell you on good authority that when Monty Hall dies, he'll be spending a lot of time behind door number three. I often wonder why there's no blue food. Every other color is well represented in the food kingdom. Corn is yellow, spinach is green, raspberries are red, carrots are orange, grapes are purple, and mushrooms are brown. So where's the blue food? And don't bother me with blueberries, they're purple. The same is true of blue corn and blue potatoes, they're purple. Blue cheese, nice try. It's actually white cheese with blue mold. Occasionally, you might run across some blue jello in a cafeteria. Don't eat it. It wasn't supposed to be blue. Something went wrong. When the United States is not invading some sovereign nation or setting it on fire from the air, which is more fun for our simple-minded pilots, we're usually busy declaring war on something here at home. Anything we don't like about ourselves, we declare war on it. We don't do anything about it. We just declare war. Declaring war is our only public metaphor for problem-solving. We have a war on crime, a war on poverty, a war on hate, a war on litter, a war on cancer, a war on violence, and Ronald Reagan's ultimate joke, the war on drugs. More accurately, the war on the Constitution. But there's no war on homelessness. You notice that? It's because there's no money in it. If someone could end homelessness and in the process let the corporate swine steal a couple of billion dollars, you'd see the streets of America clear up pretty goddamn quickly. But if you think it's going to be solved through human decency, relax. It's not going to happen. You know what I think they ought to do about homelessness? Change the name. It's not homelessness. It's houselessness. It's houses these people need. Home is an abstract idea. It's a setting, a state of mind. These people need houses, physical, tangible structures. They need low-cost housing. But there's no place to put it. People don't want low-cost housing built anywhere near them. We have a thing in this country called NIMBY, not in my backyard. People don't want social assistance of any kind located anywhere near them. Just try to open a halfway house, a rehab center, a shelter for the homeless, or a home for retarded people who want to work their way into the community. Forget it. People won't allow it. Not in my backyard. People don't want anything near them, especially if there's a chance it might help somebody. It's part of that great, generous American spirit we hear so much about. You can ask the Indians about that, if you manage to find one. We've made Indians just a little hard to find. Should you need more current data, select any black family at random. Ask them how generous America has been to them. People don't want anything near them, even if it's something they think society needs, like prisons. Everybody says, build more prisons. 
but don't build them here. Well, why not? What's wrong with having a prison in your neighborhood? Seems to me it would make for a fairly crime-free area. You think a lot of crackheads and thieves and hookers are going to be hanging around in front of a fucking prison? Bullshit, they ain't going anywhere near it. What could be safer than a prison? All of the criminals are locked inside, and if a couple of them do manage to escape, what do you think they're going to do? Hang around? Check real estate prices? Bullshit, they're fucking gone. That's the whole idea of breaking out of prison, to get as far away as you possibly can. Not in my backyard. People don't want anything near them, except military bases. They like that, don't they? Give them an army or a navy base. That makes them happy. Why? Jobs. Self-interest. Even if the base is loaded with nuclear weapons, they don't give a shit. They'll say, well, I don't mind a few mutations in the family if I can get a decent job. Working people have been fucked over so long, that's the kind of decision they make now. But getting back to low-cost housing, I think I might have solved this problem. I know just the place to build housing for the homeless. Golf courses. It's perfect. Plenty of good land in nice neighborhoods, land that is currently being squandered on a mindless activity engaged in by white, well-to-do business criminals who use the game to get together so they can make deals to carve this country up a little finer among themselves. It's time for real people to reclaim the golf courses from the wealthy and turn them over to the homeless. Golf is an arrogant, elitist game that takes up entirely too much space in this country. The arrogant nature of golf is evident in the design and scale of the game. Think of how big a golf course is. It's huge. You can't see one end of it from the other. But the ball is only an inch and a half in diameter. So will someone please explain to me what these pinheaded pricks need with all that land? America has over 17,000 golf courses. They average over 150 acres apiece. That's 3 million plus acres, 4,820 square miles. You could build two Rhode Islands and a Delaware's worth of housing for the homeless on the land currently wasted on this meaningless, mindless, arrogant, racist game. And that's another thing, race. The only blacks you'll find in country clubs are carrying trays. And don't give me that Tiger Woods bullshit. Fuck Tiger Woods. He ain't black. He acts, talks, and lives like a white boy. Skin alone doesn't make you black. And let's not forget how boring golf is. Have you ever watched it on television? It's like watching flies fuck. A completely mindless game. I should think it takes a fairly low intellect to draw pleasure from the following activity. Hitting a ball with a crooked stick and then walking after it, and then hitting it again. I say, pick it up, asshole. You're lucky you found the fucking thing in the first place. Put it in your pocket and go the fuck home. But no, Dorco in the plaid knickers is going to hit the ball again, and then he's going to walk some more. I say let these rich cocksuckers play miniature golf. Let them fuck with a windmill for an hour and a half. I want to see if there's any real skill among these people. And yeah, 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 I know there are plenty of golfers who don't consider themselves rich. People who play on badly maintained public courses. Fuck them. Fuck them and shame on them. Shame for engaging in an arrogant, elitist, racist activity. Here's a great idea. I think Texas should save up 500 condemned people and execute them all at once in electric chairs. 500 electric chairs in a big gymnasium. Wouldn't that be fun? I realize Texas prefers lethal injection, but maybe they could make an exception just this once. Or how about executing people five at a time on electric couches? That would be interesting. Put a coffee table in front of them with magazines and some chips and dip. It'd be fun. Here's another good idea. If a married couple kills their kid, they should be executed in an electric love seat. Force them to hug as you pull the switch. I don't understand why prostitution is illegal. Selling is legal. Fucking is legal. So why isn't it legal to sell fucking? Why should it be illegal to sell something that's legal to give away? I can't follow the logic. Of all the things you can do to a person, giving them an orgasm is hardly the worst. In the army, they give you a medal for killing people. In civilian life, you go to jail for giving them orgasms. Am I missing something? Hey, wouldn't it be great if you could make a guy's head explode just by looking at him? Guys don't seem to be called lefty anymore.
The reason I talk to myself is that I'm the only one whose answers I accept. To my great disgust, the trend of naming children with what until recently had been considered surnames continues unabated. The latest abominations, Walker, Parker, Kendall, Flynn, and McKenna. God help us. I was thinking the other day that they ought to make those handicapped ramps a little steeper and put a few curves in them, too. I could use some laughs. I think we ought to just go ahead and make zillion a real number. Gazillion, too. A zillion could be ten million trillions, and a gazillion could be a trillion zillions. Seems to me it's time to do this. A long time ago in England, a guy named Thomas Culpepper was hanged, beheaded, quartered, and disemboweled. Why do I have the impression women were not involved in these activities? I read somewhere that in Mexico City, 300 tons of fecal matter are deposited in the air every day. So I guess you could say that not only does shit happen, it also falls on your head. In Maine, in order to save energy, there are several lighthouses that are closed at night. Sometime when you're watching a street musician, walk over in the middle of a song and whisper to him that you don't like his music. Then take a dollar out of his cup and walk away. If a group of people stand around in a circle long enough, eventually they will begin to dance. Jesus doesn't really love you, but he does think you have a great personality. Have some fun. Walk into a gift shop and tell them you came in to get your gift. How can it be a spy satellite if they announce on television that it's a spy satellite? Why is it every time some celebrity gets cancer, the National Enquirer says he's vowed to lick this thing? Just once, I'd like to hear a guy say, I've got cancer, and this is it. I'll be dead in a few months. Why don't they have a light bulb that only shines on things worth looking at? Even though men are complete assholes, you know what makes me sad about feminism? Somewhere along the way, we lost, hey, toots. Have you ever selected an item in the supermarket and put it in someone else's cart? Then you realize what you're doing, and you get sort of an alien feeling. Wait, this is not my cart. Look at this, brown flour and sheep entrails. God, I almost put my capers in this cart. Where's mine? Oh, there it is, the one with the tapioca cupcakes and the mango popsicles. Thank God. Or have you ever started to walk off with someone else's cart? Hey, that's my stuff! You have to think fast. Not yet, it isn't. It's not paid for. Technically, these things still belong to all of us. And if I feel like shopping out of your cart, that's what I'll do. Let's see. Any organic scallions in there? What's this? Elk milk? That'll be just fine. You may leave now. I've found the best way to shop for food is to work up a really big appetite. Fast for several days, smoke a couple of joints, take $700, and go to the supermarket. It's great. You buy everything. Wow, canned bread. Just what I need. And all the good things, the things you really love and can't do without, well, you got to buy two of them because you know you're going to eat one of them on the way home at a red light. Shopping hungry is great. You just keep loading things into your cart. But then, after several aisles, you realize you may have overdone it. You find yourself pushing a motorcade of three carts, all tied together with long loops of string cheese. Once again, you've lost control. And so, as you realize you don't have enough money to pay for everything, you begin to put back some of the more expensive items, like meat. Twenty-seven dollars, bullshit. I'll put back these steaks and grab a few more pound cakes. The kids shouldn't be eating meat anyway. The nicest thing about putting things back in the supermarket is that you can put them anywhere you want. No one cares. You can leave the Robitussin next to the ham hocks. You can stick the marshmallows in with the bacon bits. They don't care. They have people who come around at midnight to straighten that stuff out. And in the morning, everything is back where it belongs. By the way, next time you shop at a supermarket in a neighborhood that has higher than average marijuana use, take a look at the cookie section. Combat zone. Half the packages have been opened, and all the really good cookies are gone. Where the hell are the Malamars? Oh, we can't get Malamars into the store. Folks line up at the loading dock for Malamars. 
There are always plenty of crappy cookies. You ever notice that? Shitty, low-priced local cookies like Jim's Home Style Cookies, 26 varieties. I say, damn, Jim, if you can't make cookies in 25 tries, leave me out. Time to head home, folks. So let's get on the checkout line here and read People magazine. By the way, I must admit I'm a real sucker on the checkout line. I'm an impulse buyer. Anything that's on display, I want it. I even buy things other people leave behind. Wow! Extra spicy diet fudge raisin tartar sauce. Must be a sale. Great. I got the last one. One final thought. Have you ever been on the express line and tried to convince the tough-looking Hispanic girl with the tattoos that 27 packages of hot dogs are really just one item? I'm always grateful when she finally gives in. Go ahead, mister. It's quicker than beating the shit out of you. I don't know about you folks, but I think O.J. got screwed. Double jeopardy is just plain wrong. Civil trial, my ass. Not fair. O.J. beat the system and he should be allowed to enjoy it. Geraldo and Charles Grodin don't like O.J. Simpson. Geraldo and Charles Grodin deal in certitude, you know? Guys like that almost always impress me. But I'm really glad O.J. beat the rap. Personally, I'd like to see him on TV again doing commercials. Must be something he could do. Roach Motel. They checks in, but they don't checks out. It'd be fun. We need more fun. People get upset with all the wrong things. Like these guys Jeffrey Dahmer and Timothy McVeigh. Right away, everybody wants to kill them. Let me tell you something. You don't kill guys like that. That's exactly what they want. You know what you do? You let them off with a warning. Just like a speeding ticket. Sometimes all a guy like that needs is a good talking to. You sit him down and you say, Listen, Jeff, nobody thinks you're funny, okay? No one is amused. So calm down and knock off the shit. Stop trying to draw attention to yourself. You eat one more person and you're in big trouble. A lot of these guys never hear that sort of thing. I think it would make them think twice before they cooked another person's head and ate it. Don't you? Now, as to Timothy McVeigh, you've got a slightly different situation here. After all, the guy's a veteran, so you have to show him a little consideration. And don't forget, it's his first offense. So I say let him off with a warning. Throw a good scare into him. Tim... One more trick like that, and it's going to mean a hefty fine. A dog doesn't understand time. Like a young child, he doesn't know the difference between 8 o'clock and a week ago Tuesday. The only period of time a dog understands is forever. And that's how long he thinks everything's going to last. You ever scratch your dog behind the ears? They really love that, don't they? Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Daddy's scratching me behind the ears. My favorite thing. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. This is great. And you're scratching and scratching, and he's loving it, and looking up at you adoringly, his eyes rolling back in his head, and then suddenly you stop. And he looks at you like you're some kind of diseased criminal pervert. He's disappointed. He thought the scratching was going to last forever. He can't help it. He just doesn't know what time it is. It's especially bad when you go out and leave him alone. He thinks you're never coming back. Never. That must be what he thinks, or else why would he act the way he does when you finally get home? All hyper and excited and revved up, like you just ate a pound and a half of methamphetamine. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. I thought you were never going to come home. I thought you were never going to come home. I thought you were never going to come home. I thought you were never going to come home. I was so scared. I was lonely, scared and lonely. I didn't know what to do. I was all alone. I thought I would never eat again. I don't know how to prepare food. I'm a dog. I can't cook. I can't do anything. I don't even know how to operate a can opener. How do you do that? What do you do? Push down the little handle? Couldn't figure it out. Give me some food. Give me a kiss. Shake hands. Here's my paw. You want me to roll over? I'll do it. Just don't leave me. Don't go. Don't go. I swear I'll never pee in the house again. I'll never pee anywhere again. Just don't leave me alone. And it doesn't matter how long you've been gone. They go into this speed freak mode, even if all you did was forget your hat and come back a few seconds later. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. I thought you were never going to come home. I thought you were never going to come home, etc., etc. Is that how you say that? Etc. Anyway, I got hungry. Again, the minute you left, I was going to eat the cat. Couldn't find him. Where the fuck's the cat? What did you do? Hide the cat? Lester, will you stop it? Calm down. I was just here a few seconds ago. They really miss you. And they have no idea what time it is. (music) 
At some point in every stage show I do, I take a sip of water and I ask the audience, how's the water here? I haven't gotten a positive response yet. Not one. Last year, I was in about a hundred different cities. Not one audience was able to give me a positive answer. Nobody trusts their water supply. Nobody. And that amuses me, because it means the system is beginning to collapse, beginning to break down. I enjoy chaos and disorder, not just because they help me professionally, but they're also my hobby. I'm an entropy buff. In high school, when I first heard of entropy, I was attracted to it immediately. They said that in nature, all systems are breaking down. And I thought, what a wonderful thing. Perhaps I can make some small contribution to this process myself. And of course, it's not just true of nature, it's true of society as well. If you look carefully, you can see that the social structure is just beginning to break down, just beginning to come apart at the seams. And what I like about that is that it makes the news on television more exciting. I watch the news for only one thing, entertainment. That's all I want. You know my favorite thing on television? Bad news. Accidents, disasters, catastrophes, explosions, fires. I want to see shit being destroyed and bodies flying around. I'm not interested in the budget. I don't care about tax negotiations. I don't want to know what country the Pope is in. But show me a burning hospital with people on crutches jumping off the roof and I'm a happy guy. I want to see a paint factory blowing up, an oil refinery explode, and a tornado hit a church on Sunday. I want to be told there's a guy running through the Kmart shooting at customers with an automatic weapon. I want to see thousands of people in the street killing policemen, hear about a nuclear meltdown in a big city, find out the stock market dropped 4,000 points in one day. I want to see people under pressure. Sirens, flames, smoke, bodies, graves being filled, parents weeping, my kind of TV, exciting shit. I just want to see some entertainment. That's the kind of guy I am. You know what I like most? Big chunks of steel, concrete, and fiery wood falling out of the sky and people running around trying to get out of the way. Exciting shit. And at least I admit it, folks, you know? Most people won't admit these feelings. Most people see something like that, they say, oh, isn't that awful? Bullshit, lying asshole. You love it and you know it. Explosions are fun. And the closer the explosion is to your house, the more fun it is. Have you ever noticed that? Sometimes an announcer comes on television and says, 6,000 people were killed in an explosion today. And you say, where, where? He says, in Pakistan. You say, ah, fuck Pakistan. Too far away to be fun. But if he says it happened in your hometown, you say, oh, oh hot shit, Dave. Come on, let's go down and look at the bodies. I love bad news. Doesn't bother me. The more bad news there is, the faster this system collapses. I'm glad the water sucks. You know what I do about it? I drink it. I fucking drink it. You see, I'm not one of those people who worries about everything. Do you have people around you like that? The country's full of them now. People walking around all day worried about everything. Worried about the air, the water, the soil, pesticides, food additives, carcinogens, radon, asbestos. Worried about saving endangered species. Let me tell you about endangered species. Saving endangered species is just one more arrogant human attempt to control nature. That's what got us in trouble in the first place. Interfering with nature. Meddling. Doesn't anybody understand that? And as far as endangered species are concerned, it's a phony issue. Over 90% of all the species that ever lived on this planet are gone. They're extinct. We didn't kill them. They just disappeared. That's what species do. They appear and they disappear. It's nature's way. Irrespective of our behavior, species vanish at the rate of 25 a day. Let them go gracefully. Stop interfering. Leave nature alone. Haven't we done enough damage? We're so self-important, so arrogant. Everybody's going to save something now. Save the trees, save the bees, save the whales, save the snails. And the supreme arrogance, save the planet. Are these people kidding? Save the planet? We don't even know how to take care of ourselves. We haven't learned how to care for one another. We're going to save the fucking planet? I'm getting tired of that shit. I'm tired of fucking Earth Day. And I'm tired of these self-righteous environmentalist white bourgeois liberals who think the only thing wrong with this country is that there aren't enough bike paths. 
trying to make the world safe for their repulsive Volvos. Besides, environmentalists don't give a shit about the planet anyway. Not really. Not in the abstract. You know what they're interested in? A clean place to live. Their own habitat. That's all. They're worried that sometime in the future they might be personally inconvenienced. Narrow, unenlightened self-interest doesn't impress me. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with the planet in the first place. The planet is fine. The people are fucked. Compared with the people, the planet is doing great. It's been here over four billion years. Did you ever think about that? The planet has been here four and a half billion years. And we've been here for what? A hundred thousand? And we've only been engaged in heavy industry for a little over 200 years. 200 versus 4.5 billion. And we have the nerve, the conceit to think that somehow we're a threat that somehow we're going to put this beautiful little blue-green ball in jeopardy? Believe me, the planet has put up with much worse than us. It's been through earthquakes, volcanoes, plate tectonics, solar flares, sunspots, magnetic storms, pole reversals, planetary floods, worldwide fires, tidal waves, wind and water erosion, cosmic rays, ice ages, and hundreds of thousands of years of bombardment by comets, asteroids, and meteors. And people think a few plastic bags and aluminum cans are going to make a difference? The planet isn't going anywhere, folks. We are. We're going away. Pack your shit. We're going away. And we won't leave much of a trace. Thank God for that. Nothing left. Maybe a little styrofoam. The planet will be here and we'll be gone. Another failed mutation. Another closed-end biological mistake. The planet will shake us off like a bad case of fleas, and it will heal itself, because that's what the planet does. It's a self-correcting system. The air and water and earth will recover and be renewed, and if plastic is really not degradable, well, most likely the planet will incorporate it into a new paradigm, the Earth plus plastic. Earth doesn't share our prejudice against plastic. Plastic came out of the Earth. She probably sees it as one of her many children. In fact, it could be the reason the Earth allowed us to be spawned in the first place. It wanted plastic and didn't know how to make it. It needed us. That could be the answer to our age-old question. Why are we here? Plastic, assholes. And so our job is done. The plastic is here. We can now be phased out. And I think that's already begun, don't you? I mean, to be fair, the planet probably sees us as a mild threat, something to be dealt with. And I'm sure it can defend itself in the manner of a large organism, the way a beehive or an ant colony would muster a defense. I'm sure the planet will think of something. What would you be thinking if you were the planet, trying to defend yourself against this pesky, troublesome species? Let's see, what might I try? Hmm, viruses might be good. These humans seem vulnerable to viruses, and, and viruses are tricky, always mutating and developing new strains when new medicines or vaccines are introduced. And perhaps the first virus I try could be one that compromises their immune systems, a human immunodeficiency virus that makes them vulnerable to other infections that come along. And perhaps this virus could be spread sexually, making them reluctant to engage in the act of reproduction, further reducing their numbers. Well, I guess it's a poetic notion, but it's a start, and I can dream, can't I? No, folks, I don't worry about the little things. Bees, trees, whales, snails. I don't worry about them. I think we're part of a much greater wisdom, greater than we will ever understand, a higher order. Call it what you like. I call it the big electron, the big electron. It doesn't punish, it doesn't reward, and it doesn't judge. It just is. And so are we, for a little while. See ya. Well, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a pleasure to be your content provider for the last few hours. Now you'll have to provide your own content for a while, until I see you again. Have fun doing so, and remember, 